Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Camille had already been living in the orphanage for more than six months. The 13-year-old girl kept herself apart all this time. She did not want to come into contact with her peers and classmates. For this, she was nicknamed Bun. Camille was not at all offended by this offensive nickname as she realized that it was her own fault that now she is called such a girl. When she got to the orphanage, she kept thinking, was it right that she volunteered to live in this institution? After all, Camille told the class teacher about her life, and the teacher sounded the alarm, and all was that Camille had divided her life into two parts. Until the age of 11, the girl grew up a happy child. She was cherished by her mom, and dad tried his best, they could to buy fashionable things. In general, the parents wanted their daughter to not need anything. And then something happened, and everything went wrong. Initially, the parents between themselves began to fight often, after which the girl's mother often cried. Then he stopped coming home. The father slept over. Camille realized that there was an unhealthy atmosphere in the house, and it would not end well. However, Camille couldn't understand why her parents were fighting, and so she asked her mother, Why do you and her father fight so often? Do you really want to know? I do. I want us to live like we used to, happily and as a family, and I don't want you to cry. Then go and ask your father why we fight with him. The girl nodded to her mother in response, and when her father came, she turned to him with the same question. The father looked at his daughter carefully, and then called her back to the children's room and put her on a chair, and sat opposite him. The man nervously ran his palm through his hair and then said, Daughter, you are not so small, and some things should understand. Anyway, I've fallen out of love with your mother, and I want to divorce her. I wanted to talk to you about it earlier, but I didn't dare. Divorcing my mom won't affect our relationship. I just won't live here, but I'll visit you. Dad, is there another woman in your life? That's a serious question. I'll be honest with you. You're right. I have a woman I love and want to live with. You've made your point. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Roughly said the girl and rushed to the bathroom, where she gave vent to tears. Now Camille understood her mother, who had been crying a lot lately. After this conversation with her father, a few days passed, and the man soon packed his things and left their family. Camille became withdrawn after Papa's departure. She was incredibly hurt that her father had betrayed her and her mom for another woman. And the girl's mother, after she was abandoned by her husband, just sobbed and cursed her fate. At first Camille's father visited her, coming once a week to school after lessons. However, Camille did not talk to him and tried to get away from her father as soon as possible. This continued for a month, and the man began to come to school less and less often. Meanwhile, the girl's mother, in order to somehow survive the betrayal, began to impose on strong drinks. Even not perfectly understood that the mother degenerates every day. And when once again the father appeared at school, the girl told him everything and asked him to talk to her mother. The man looked sadly at his daughter and said that he would not do this. And then he added, Your mom is a grown woman and should understand what she is doing. And I also want to say that now I will rarely visit you. You don't spoil me much with your visits anyway. There's a reason for that. I have a woman I live with who's expecting a baby in the near future, and now I'm gonna have a lot on my mind. You must realize that a baby needs a lot of attention. That's a great thing to say. You're telling your own daughter. So I don't want to be taken care of. Get out then, and you cannot appear in my life at all. Barely holding back her sobs, the girl said. I understand that you are offended at the moment. Be patient a little. As soon as the baby is born and grows up, I will visit you more often. You should be happy, because you'll have a sister I'll introduce you to. I've told you everything. Go away. And don't show up with anyone. I don't want to meet anyone. I hate you and despise you." The girl said quickly and hurried home. Camille couldn't wait to cry, 
but she didn't want to do it in front of her father. As soon as Camille got home, she rushed to her room and burst into tears. She wanted her mother to be there to tell her about her conversation with her father. However, when her mother came home drunk, the girl lost all desire to tell her mother anything. A few days passed. Camille came home and was very surprised to find the front door unlocked. Camille remembered exactly that she had closed the door. The girl entered the room and saw that her mother was sitting in the kitchen with tea and a cat on the table. Camille involuntarily wrinkled her nose and said to Mama, are you drinking again? For some reason, it wasn't at work that I got fired. Can you imagine, my daughter? Such a valuable employee was kicked out of the company. What are we going to do now? I'll look for a new job. Don't worry, everything will be fine. It's all your father's fault. He left us to our fate. Camille hoped her mother would go to look for a new job the next day, but she didn't. The girl's mother drank heavily for almost a week while she had money. When the finances ran out, she started selling gold jewelry first, and then she started selling things. This went on for some time. Camille tried her best to convince her mother to stop drinking, but she, being drunk, drove away her daughter Camille realized that soon they would not be able to buy bread. The girl did not know what to do. Camille began to feel hungry all the time, as her mother rarely cooked at home, and lately her mother began to leave in the evening and come back in the morning and again drunk. That's when Camille decided to talk to Emily's class teacher. She told the teacher about her life. The teacher listened attentively to the school girl, and then said to the girl, You can't live like this. I will try to talk to your mom, but I am afraid it will be a waste of time. The only thing I can offer you is to live in an orphanage, where you will be properly taken care of. Maybe the termination of parental rights will make your mom reconsider her views on life, and she will give up her addiction. And don't get me wrong that after your story I will have to contact the guardianship authorities anyway, because I have to respond to the fact that my student does not finish her meals and often stays home alone at night. The very next day, Emily tried to talk to Camille's mother, but the conversation did not work, as the landlady was in an inadequate state. The teacher made another attempt two days later, but the situation was repeated. And then the teacher detained the girl after lessons and told her it was useless to talk to your mom. I ask you not to take offense at me, but I'm appealing to the guardianship authorities. I just don't have a way out. I'm not offended. I've been thinking about your words for a long time, and it seems to me that I would be much better off in an orphanage now. You see, I'm just afraid that I'll go down a crooked path and start stealing from stores so that I won't feel hungry. Good for you for thinking that way. Don't despair. Maybe when you get to the orphanage, your mom will realize that she might lose her own daughter. And soon Camille showed up at the orphanage. Now she was sitting there thinking about her mother and whether it was right for her to want to live in this institution. Camille was distracted from her thoughts by a woman's voice that said, Sitting alone again as your peers rampage outside, the girl turned around and looked at the woman with a smile. It was Evelyn the cleaning lady. Camille had become friends with her. A month after coming here, all the children at the orphanage thought Evelyn was a woman. Camille had a different opinion of the janitor. She liked it when the janitor affectionately called her by her first name and asked her how her day was going. Evelyn walked over to the girl and sat down next to her. The older woman already knew Camille's story. For what reasons the child had ended up in the orphanage, the cleaning lady herself did not understand what made her feel special toward this withdrawn girl. And now, seeing the pensive Camille, she quietly turned to her, what she was dreaming about at the moment. Honestly, about my mom in my life. Tell me if it's not a secret. I've been waiting a long time for my mom to come and take me away from here. But she never even visited me once. And now I was wondering if I was right to want to live in an orphanage. And now I realize that I was right. I don't need the pits at all. And I have an aversion to her. I feel like pretty soon, I'm just gonna hate her. You can't say that about your own mother. You know, I grew up in an orphanage too. My mom gave me up when I was a baby. And at first, I had the same thoughts as you. But as I'd grown up, 
I've changed my mind drastically. Tell me why. Interested? Camille asked. I'll try to explain it to you with my own example. As soon as I left the orphanage, I entered medical school. When I graduated, I met a young man named Roman. This guy started courting me, and soon we both realized that we loved each other. Soon we had a wedding with him. And then we had our firstborn son, who was named Constantin. And now, I come to the most important part. Why did I stop hating my mother? It's because with my husband I lived in peace and harmony. We had a wonderful son. You see, I've been a happy woman all these years. And now you just imagine that if my mother had not given birth to me, I would not have experienced any of this, because I would not be in this world. And that's why I am grateful to my mother for giving me life. And let my mother left me in the hospital, but I do not blame her, because it is quite possible that she had good reasons for it. But you know my story, don't you? My mom's only good reason was to drink hard liquor. Your mom slipped up. She's a weak person. Not everyone can be a strong person. Don't just hate her. Believe that you'll grow up. You'll have a happy life. And you will thank your mom more than once for living in this world. Smiling, said the old woman. I don't know. Maybe you are right about that. And tell me, why do you work as a cleaner if you have a nursing education? That's a separate story. At one time I worked as a nurse in a children's clinic. When the years passed, I retired, but continued to work. But soon the management told me that it was necessary to give way to young staff. I had to quit. I did not regret it, as I had a loving husband with me. And my son at that time got married and left for another city. And after I was retired and sitting at home, my husband passed away a year later. And why did you go back to work after that? I gum understand. Sitting alone in four walls is not a particularly pleasant occupation. You're so young, you wouldn't realize it. I just started to feel lonely. And then my son took out a mortgage to buy an apartment. He needed help with the money. So I decided that I'd rather work than just stay at home beating around the bush. And now I've been working here for four years, and I've never regretted it. Why don't the children from the orphanage treat you well? I think that this is a question you should ask your peers, not me. Evelyn said with a smile. And then she added, And to find out the answers of boys and girls, you need to talk to them, not stay away from them. Years of life went by. Everything was also kept aloof from peers. Both the boys and the orphanage staff were used to it by now. Except that Evelyn was dissatisfied with the fact that Camille was not a sociable child and often talked to the girl about it. And the girl, in turn, in response, only kept silent. Time flew by. And now Camille has already turned 18 years old. It was time for the girl to start living on her own. And the day before Camille had to leave the orphanage, she was approached by a cleaning lady who said, you're starting a new epic in your life. You must be careful. Because living on your own, you can make a lot of mistakes. I know that the state gave you a one-room apartment somewhere in the periphery. But that's okay. The main thing is that you have your own corner. The only place you've been allocated is there. There's no furniture. I already thought of that. I'll buy you a kitchen table with four stools. It'll be a housewarming gift. A bed and a dresser. I'll give them from my son's room. He doesn't need this furniture. But it'll be good for you. I'll give you some of the kitchen utensils. Of course. You've got to give me something to eat. When I decide to visit you, if you don't mind, I'll always be glad to have you here. You've been so supportive while I've been here. I'll be eternally grateful. Oh, don't give me that big talk. And what kind of gratitude is there to be thankful for? Why don't you tell me what you're gonna do? How are you gonna get out of here? I want to be an announcer. And I'm gonna try to get into college. And of course, I'll look for part-time work in the evenings to make a living. And if you don't get in, believe me, it happens a lot. I'll get a job, and in a year I'll try again. And soon Camille moved into a studio apartment. She quickly got settled in and immediately got to know her neighbor. It was a middle-aged woman whose name was Wendy. Soon Camille tried to enter the institute, 
but disappointment awaited her. The girl missed a few points. After she found out that she was unlucky with the enrollment, she came home in a bad mood. She wanted to cry with grief. Camille only sat down on the bed as she received a call on her cell phone from Evelyn, who asked how things were going. The girl tried not to cry and mouthed, I didn't get in, and I had so much faith in my abilities. That says what? That you shouldn't be overconfident. Just write that you're going to make your beautiful face raw and put it aside for the moment. Otherwise, I'll scold you like a little girl who went to the wrong potty, the old woman said sternly. Do you know how to cheer up? Laughing, the girl said. That's great. What are your plans now? Well, I'm going to look for a job. I need finances to live on. A few days later, the girl got a job in a flower pavilion. The manager at first worked together with Camille, helping her to learn the art of how to beautifully design a bouquet. And after a couple of weeks, the director of the pavilion, Jenna, approved the girl's actions and said that now she could work independently. Camille was happy because she was praised by the director. And so the first day came when Camille went out to work at the pavilion. One girl was very worried, but the first shift went out without any misunderstandings. And on the second day, Camille went to work without worrying that she would not be able to fulfill her duties. The first month flew by as Camille worked in the flower pavilion. The girl enjoyed going to work. One day a young man came to see her and immediately complimented Camille on her good looks. Camille often heard such words from representatives of the stronger sex and calmly treated them. But this young man said the compliment in a special way, and the girl looked at him with interest. Meanwhile, the guy said, Can I buy a bouquet of flowers that will reflect your beauty? Camille, hearing this, laughed and handed the visitor a bouquet of decorative daisies. The young man, seeing the flowers, also laughed and said, You obviously underestimate yourself. And to be honest, I need the bouquet to give to my friend's girlfriend. It's her birthday today. Camille looked around at the ready bouquets and then chose gladioli. She handed the flowers to the young man and said that such a bouquet should be to the girl's taste. The guy took the mustache and paid and then asked permission to see Camille off in the evening. Camille was not ready for this and therefore refused. Soon the visitor left. The girl had worked her shift and was getting ready to close the pavilion when she saw again the guy who had complimented her today. She looked questioningly at the young man and asked him if he needed another bouquet. No flowers today. I just want to see you off. But I already refused your request. All right. Then sell me a bouquet of white roses. Camille complied with the visitor's request, and he took the flowers and put them on the counter, saying that the roses were bought for her. And after that, the guy left the pavilion. The girl was surprised by the stranger's behavior and at that moment thought that the young man was strange. After this incident, a couple of days passed, and Camille already closed the pavilion and was going to go home. Suddenly, she was called by a lover of daisies. Would you give me a couple of minutes? Camille looked at the stranger and recognized him as the man who had recently given her roses. The young man stood near the foreign car and elbowed her. The girl asked what the guy wanted and the one after her words came up to her and answered that he could not wait to get acquainted with the beauty. Camille did not know how to act in this situation and therefore said, let's not do this. And I disgust you. The young man said in surprise, I didn't say that. I'm just not used to it. Getting acquainted like that. You're putting a price on yourself sarcastically said the stranger. And then he added, how long do you have to be groomed to tell me your name? All right, you're on. My name is Camille. Now we're talking. And my name is Stephen. Let's get you a ride in the car. If you want a ride, I'm not getting in the car on foot. Stephen nodded and followed the girl. The young man told different anecdotes about Camille laughed. The girl noted to herself that the new acquaintance was an excellent conversationalist and easy to communicate with. And soon the couple approached Camille's house. Camille thanked the guy for seeing her off, but Stephen stopped her and asked for permission to take a leisurely walk with her again tomorrow. The girl, after some thought, agreed. 
When she got home, Camille involuntarily thought about the man. It suddenly seemed to her that perhaps this man was her soulmate. And then she pushed these thoughts away from her, realizing that she did not know Stephen at all to allow such thoughts. All the following week the young man met the girl from work almost every day. From him she learned that he was 24 years old and studying at the institute. The guy also said that he lived on his own in a two-room apartment. Stephen said that his father is engaged in business and his mother is a housewife. When Camille heard all this, she said with a smile, You're just like a major. That's right. I think I am, too, and it doesn't offend me. Why did I tell you all about me? You haven't told me anything about your own person. I'm also interested to know who your parents are, why you work in a flower pavilion and not study. Camille looked at the guy and said that she was a pupil of an orphanage. She did not tell him the reason why she had gotten there. She was uncomfortable to admit that her mom consumed strong drinks. Stephen, when he heard that Camille was from the orphanage, looked at her in a strange way. This look was noticed by the girl, and she asked what was wrong. The guy at the same moment smiled welcomingly and said that everything was fine, and then invited the interlocutor to come to visit him. Camille refused. It seemed to her that it was too early to be alone with Stephen. The young man, when he heard that Camille did not want to visit, said reproachfully, and I thought we trusted each other, but it turned out to be completely different. I get the feeling you think I'm a monster. You're wrong. You're a nice guy, but I'd rather get some fresh air than sit in an apartment. But it's better to get some fresh air than to sit in an apartment. You and I have plenty of time. Take me up on my offer. By the way, I have a large soap collection. I know my hobby sounds weird, but I collect soap. Interesting. With a smile said a girl and thought, and why not really come to visit? Well, at least for an hour. The young man, seeing the doubts of the interlocutor, immediately said, I'll get you home safe and sound, and you will choose the soap you like. You can even have several and take it from me as president. The girl looked at Stephen and agreed. The couple got into the car and the car started. Camille was riding in a foreign car for the first time. She was inspecting the interior. The young man was discreetly observing it. When the girl turned her attention to the road, the guy asked if she liked the car. Camille enthusiastically concluded that the car was wonderful. She added that it must be very expensive. Stephen voiced the cost, and the interlocutor ouch, nodded. The driver, seeing her reaction, laughed. Soon the couple was already in Stephen's apartment. The girl immediately assessed the atmosphere and softly mumbled that everything here is arranged with taste. The young man smiled and replied that it was the merit of his mother. And then the owner of the apartment offered the guests to drink a glass of sparkling wine. But Camille flatly refused. Then Stephen opened the bar and took out a bottle of liquor from there. He dug it out and splashed the liquid into the shot glasses with the words, I bought it when I suggested you buy it from Aristov. This drink is not quoted in the orphanage. You must be used to Belenka. The girl from these words of the guy shuddered as from a blow, and sharply said that she does not use strong drinks at all, and then said that if he once again allowed himself to talk to her in this way, then their communication on this note stops. The guy smiled in response and asked his guest to relax, promising that he would not allow himself to do that again. And then Stephen poured himself a strong drink and emptied the glass. The girl, seeing this, involuntarily wrinkled her nose. Then she asked to see the soap collection. The owner of the apartment cordially agreed to fulfill Camille's request and invited her into the bathroom, where the original shelf on the entire wall was pierced on which were arranged pieces of soap. The girl began to look at the collection with curiosity. Meanwhile, the young man had left the bathroom and had another 100 grams of hard liquor before returning to his visit. Stephen watched as Camille stood on tiptoe and took out first one bar of soap, which she brought to her nose and inhaled the aroma, and then the next. The man felt at that moment 
A desire to possess this girl right now at this moment enveloped him. And he wrapped his arms around Camille and his hands and turns her to face him, and then starts to tear off the girl's blouse. Camille screamed out loudly for him to leave her alone. However, the guy picked up the guest in his arms and carried her to the couch. Camille was already well aware of what the owner of the apartment was going to do. And then she screamed, stop, please. I don't want it to happen like this. After all, I haven't been intimate with a man once before. Not to build for myself, not to cross the road from the orphanage. And they've been doing it there since they were 12. Just be a decent girl now, and we'll give each other pleasure. Camille tried to push the young man away, but the forces were unequal, and after a while Stephen lay on his back and breathed often. And the girl, tucking her legs under her belly, barely audible, was crying. The owner of the apartment, literally after a few minutes from breathing, said, and you did not deceive me. It turned out, in fact, pious diva, but you pass. You liked it too, didn't you? But tell me the truth, I will now rest, and we can continue. After these words, the girl jumped to her feet and ran to the kitchen, where she grabbed a knife. As soon as Stephen began to approach her, she screamed exhaustedly that she would take her own life if he came near her. The landlord snorted and calmly replied, I don't need to touch you. I've had mine. Now you can go to all four sides. By the way, you can choose a few bars of soap from the collection. That's your pleasure fee. If you want to meet me, you'll find my address here. Oh, and one more thing. Don't go to the police because my father has connections there. You're only hurting yourself by doing this. The girl looked at the guy with hatred and quickly got dressed, then ran out of the apartment. Camille knew that it was a long way for her to get home, and it would be better to take transportation. But she felt like people knew what had just happened and were looking at her with judgment. So Camille decided that she would get home on her own. Soon the girl was already in the apartment, where she immediately rushed into the bathroom. She wanted to wash herself off with the touch of Stephen's hands. Camille rubbed her body with exasperation, silent. Then Camille sank to the bottom of the tub and sobbed bitterly. The next day, Camille asked the director of the flower pavilion for a day off. The girl told the supervisor that she felt disgusting. The supervisor advised her to call a doctor and said she would work by herself for a few days, while Camille is not feeling well. The girl has been manifesting at home for several days. She did not answer her neighbor's calls, and also the cleaner of the orphanage. Camille just wanted to be at home for a while, and hoped that she would succeed. However, Evelyn thought quite differently, who was concerned that the ward was not answering her calls, and the elderly woman initially went to the girl's workplace, and after finding out why Camille was absent from the pavilion, she had already gone to her home. The elderly woman rang the doorbell for a long time, and then, realizing she wouldn't get that one opened, said loudly, I know you're home. If you don't open the door, I'll break it down. And you know very well that I will. Camille, knowing the temper of the cleaning lady, I realized that Evelyn would do as the girl said, opened the door and saw the worried face, the elderly woman. Camille smiled tiredly and invited the guest to pass Evelyn looked at the wards and sternly asked what had happened. Camille did not want to tell the cleaning lady anything, and so she lied to her that she had quarreled with a young man. The guests looked at the girl with amazement and muttered, That's the guy you're killing for. The one you just met. I don't understand you. Did you fall in love so quickly? Let's go to the kitchen and have a cup of tea, and you can tell me all about it. Camille realized that Evelyn would have to lie, so she quickly made up stories. She told the elderly woman that she had quarreled with the young man because he had forbidden her to work. The guest, hearing the explanation, only laughed and remained silent. That's a silly reason for a quarrel. You should have told your boyfriend that you need something to live on. And if he's going to support you, let him do it. I'm not gonna tell him anything. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Maybe I could have a mother-son talk with him. No way. Better tell me how things are going at the orphanage. The landlady spoke, 
trying to distract Evelyn from the dangerous topic. Time moved slowly. Camille went to work and then went straight home. Stephen did not appear in her life. What was the girl glad of? She wanted to cut this man out of her life completely and never think of him. So Camille got up in the morning as usual. She had to go to work. As Camille felt sick, she rushed to the restroom, where she immediately threw up. The girl was puzzled as to what had happened to her, but immediately she tried to put all thoughts about her health aside as she had to get ready for work. Camille hoped that the nausea would go away during the day, but it did not. The young woman came home irritated after a day of work. She was depressed about her own physical condition and did not even eat dinner that day. She went to bed early. The next day, the same thing happened again. The girl felt nauseous all the time. After work, she went to the store to buy milk, which she loved very much and allowed herself to buy on rare occasions. Camille went to the counter and wanted to take a bottle. She realized that if she took even a sip of milk, she would immediately vomit. Camille did not buy anything and went home. When she got home, the girl sat down on the bed. The doorbell rang. Camille opened it and saw a neighbor who was holding fried pies on a plate. The woman unceremoniously entered the apartment and spoke. I want to treat you to some baked goods. I happened to buy fuel milk today. Oh, don't even remind me of milk. It makes me sick at one word, said the girl, looking at her saliva. I don't understand you. You've always loved milk, and now you're sick of it. I've been sick of it since yesterday. I thought it would go away today, but it didn't. How's your stool? It's fine. I'm walking. It's not poisoning. You know, sweetheart, all your symptoms indicate that you're pregnant. I have a pretty good idea who the father of this baby is. I've seen your young man out the window a few times with you, only now he's gone missing. If I were you, I'd go to the drugstore and get a test. I'm not a gynecologist, but trust me, you're definitely in the right place. Don't be silly. I won't drink tea because I'm tired at work. I'm sleepy. With a slightly noticeable irritation muttered the landlady of the apartment, who at this minute wanted Wendy to go to her room. The neighbor, hearing that she was being beaten about missing resentfully pressed her lips together and quickly left. As soon as the woman left the apartment Camille began to pack quickly. She only wanted to buy a pregnancy test after Wendy's words. The girl was able to allow the thought that she could have gotten pregnant by the rascal. Camille bought the test and persevered with the appropriate procedure. The girl was very worried. She absolutely did not want to give birth to a child from Stephen, who had done such a thing to her. When the test showed positive results, Camille squatted down and cried desperately. The young woman did not know what to do in this situation. The first thing that came to mind was to talk to Evelyn and tell her everything honestly. Camille received a call from the cleaning lady and asked her to come to visit her tomorrow. The elderly woman readily agreed and asked what to take for tea. Camille replied that there was no need to bring any guests since she had Krieger. Evelyn wanted to ask her mentee something else, but she said that the whole conversation would take place tomorrow. The next day in the evening, the old woman was already sitting at Camille's house. The landlady, with her head down, told how she had visited Stephen and how it had all ended. Evelyn listened attentively to Camille and asked what she was going to do. Camille tearfully said she wanted to terminate the pregnancy. When the guest heard this, she said softly, and you are sure of your decision. Very often it happens that after such procedures, women can no longer have children. But we have modern medicine, and I have nothing to fear. Just understand, if I give birth to this child, this baby will remind me all the time what he did. I am afraid that I hate this child. I'm also afraid that the child will inherit the father's genes and be just as much of a rascal in life. Wait, this is where it all comes together. Is that too much to be afraid of? Let me get this straight. What about medicine? You know, there's a saying that goes, there's a silver lining. That's the case with you. Let's move on. That the child will resemble his father, but it won't. As soon as you put the baby to the breast to feed, you'll realize that this baby is yours alone. 
Now, about genes. What do genes have to do with it? You're gonna raise the baby. What you put into it is what you'll reap. I'm not in any way trying to talk you into keeping the baby. I'm just trying to make you realize that you have to make these decisions consciously, not in haste, when emotions are running high. And that's what you're going through right now. My advice to you is to go to a gynecologist and make sure that you are pregnant, since tests can also give wrong results. If the pregnancy is confirmed, then check with the doctor until what term you can think about whether to keep the baby or not. And only after that, make a decision. After a while, Camille had already been to the women's clinic and knew for sure that she was in an interesting position. The young woman had contradictory feelings. On the one hand, she was pleased that life had begun inside her. But on the other hand, when she thought of Stephen, she felt disgusted with the child. Camille procrastinated for a long time and then made the choice that she would give birth to this baby and it would be a joy in her life. The young woman was informed about her decision by the orphanage worker, who was happy to hear the news and immediately said that she would give the stroller as a gift as a grandmother. After Evelyn learned that the ward would give birth, she came to visit her and from the threshold said that it was necessary to have a serious talk. Camille was surprised at this and invited the elderly woman into the guest room and sat down and looked at the landlady carefully and only then spoke. Having a baby is good, but you need to think about the financial side. You have to persuade your manager to make you an official salesperson. That way you'll get an allowance. And if she refuses, find a way to get the director of the flower pavilion to agree. You'll need that money to live on in the future. You know I don't just give advice. After all, I've lived most of my life already. And please don't put off this conversation with your supervisor until later Camille after this conversation with Evelyn turned to her supervisor. Jenna promised to think about it. And now a month has passed since that conversation and the supervisor has remained silent on the subject. Camille again talked to her supervisor about official employment. Jenna promised that she would do it in a week. However, a month passed, but the supervisor did not lift a finger on the matter. And when Camille tried to talk about it again, the supervisor pointed to the young woman's slightly bulging belly and said, do you want me to pay you benefits? But that's not going to happen. Why would I transfer my money to nowhere? You don't say, what do you mean, nowhere? This money will be a great help to us. As soon as the baby's old enough, I'm going back to work for you. My answer to you, no, you work one more week and then I'm firing you. You're a good girl. Yeah, she's helping the unmarried. And I'm not going to. Camille was stunned by Jenna's answer. Camille seemed to have developed a good relationship with her supervisor. After all, when the supervisor asked to stay longer after the workday, the girl willingly complied with her request. And now that Camille had been refused, she was extremely offended that she had received such a reward for all her hard work. Camille recounted this conversation with the director of Evelyn's Flower Pavilion. The elderly woman was outraged after hearing the news. She wanted to go and talk to Jenna herself and tell the manager that she was acting illegally. That's one thing. And secondly, decent people don't do that. Camille talked the old lady out of it. She said you won't get anything out of it. I worked unofficially, and that says it all. It's my own fault for not having thought of this earlier, to formalize an employment contract. Soon Camille was out of work. The young woman was handed as she realized that the salary she received after she stopped working in the flower pavilion would not be enough for a long time. So Camille began to pound various structures in order to find some kind of work before the payment of maternity benefits. However, she was denied everywhere and seeing that she is in an interesting position, and still the young woman found a job. True, it paid a pittance. The girl had to hand out advertising booklets on the street. Camille realized that she earns a pittance here, but at the moment she was happy about it. Time flew by, and now the young woman gave birth to a baby girl, whom she named Vanessa. Camille fondly felt the little bundle and mentally thanked the cleaning lady, who had made her realize that the decision should be made without any violent thoughts. 
Camille realized that it was only thanks to that conversation with the technician that she had kept the baby under her heart. And now that baby was born from the maternity ward. Camille was greeted by Evelyn. The elderly woman accepted the small package from the nurse's hands and suddenly cried. Camille was puzzled why the cleaning lady was crying now and asked her about it. You should be happy. Are you crying? Why? I'm glad you made the right decision at the right time. And now I answer to my granddaughter. Time has slowly moved on. Camille enjoyed learning the role of a mother. She was busy practicing with her daughter. All the motherly duties she lovingly performed. And even when Vanessa switched from day to night, it didn't work for the young woman to have to adjust to a child. It had been a month since Camille had become a mom. And at this point, Camille clearly realized that the allowance was completely inadequate for living. Her daughter needed to buy formula, which cost a lot of money, and she also had to buy shipping, oils, baby soap, and other baby products for the baby. The young woman was at a loss, and it was the first time she had not paid her utility bill. Another two months passed. Camille lost weight during this time, as she denied herself food, only to be fed. Camille's daughter helped Evelyn, but only in small amounts. The elderly woman saw perfectly well how difficult it was for her ward, and one day a conversation took place between the cleaning lady and Camille. Camille said to the technician in despair, I don't know what to do. I was already thinking of putting my daughter in an orphanage for a while and visiting her there. And as soon as she's a little older, I'll take her out of there and get a job in the meantime. That's the stupidest decision I've ever heard. If you do that, you'll lose Vanessa forever. You'd have to give up your parental rights if you did that. Do you even think about what you're saying? I don't know how to make ends meet. With tears in her eyes, said the girl, and immediately added other children at this age have cribs. My daughter still sleeps in the stroller you gave us. The crib is not the most important thing. I'll try to give you a little more money. I don't feel comfortable accepting finances from you anymore. I don't know when I'll be able to pay you back. I'd like to get a job, and then everything will change. After this conversation, about two weeks passed, and Evelyn came to visit Camille. The old woman went into the kitchen and put a box with a long cake on the table. The landlady looked at her guest with bewilderment and asked what kind of celebration. The cleaning lady smiled and said, Celebrating my dismissal from work, I've become too old to carry big buckets of water, and now I've decided to retire. And the salary at the orphanage is tiny. I'll be with Vanessa from now on, and you're trying to get a job, but you still need to help your son. I haven't forgotten about that. They'll cut back on their rations. There's no other option. Although there is one other option, which is to go to the father, establish paternity with DNA, and then demand child support from him. Don't ever say that to me again. I'll never go to what? This is my child and mine alone. Consider me Vanessa started from the wind in the field with a challenge, exclaimed Camille. You see, so there's only one way out. I sit busy and you look for a job. Did I like the way you stood up to Stephen just now? Evelyn said with a smile. A few days later, Camille got a job as a salesman in a small market not far from home. The young woman was attracted by the fact that the market had a convenient schedule. It was necessary to come to 7 o'clock, and the labor day ended at 14.00. The only thing that married the girl was not particularly high wages, about which she told Evelyn. The old woman said in response that she found something to be upset about. Your salary is higher than the one I received when I worked in the orphanage. Soon Camille went to work. She was a little uneasy, as she had never worked with weighty goods. However, her employer explained everything in detail and spent the day with her, helping the girl to cope with selling vegetables. And so already Camille worked for three days at the market. Here the girl met her neighbor Molly, who was selling fruit. The women talked to each other and Molly in one of the conversations unexpectedly dropped that Camille had hired an employer for nothing. The woman looked at her interlocutor with surprise and asked her why she had said that. Molly embarrassed Cashin, and then, waving her hand, spoke out. 
and what will I hide it from you? All the same, after all, the truth will tell you others. The thing is that your boss Nancy very often changed salespeople. Regular customers will tell you that soon enough. I've had a couple of people tell me that that there's a new salesperson again, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And why Nancy and the salesman do not linger. The answer is simple, constant shortages. At Sveta's the longest that the sellers have worked is four months, as far as I remember. A few days after this conversation, there was an unpleasant incident at Camille's workplace. Toward the end of the workday, as usual, Nancy and her husband arrived to pick up the proceeds. Camille counted out the money and held it out to the supervisor, who looked at the financials and grudgingly said that the amount was too small. Camille narrowed her eyes and replied that they had overpriced vegetables, and customers often left for competitors. Nancy, hearing this, said that one should be able to interest the person who approached the goods and not rely on high prices. The businesswoman then approached the vegetables and inspected them meticulously. Nancy then saw some affected tomatoes. She took out the tomatoes and placed them in front of Camille. The woman looked at the woman perplexed and said quietly, Vegetables have a way of spoiling. It's not my fault. I agree with you on that. But spoiled goods should be weighed and recorded and kept separately. But I did. I just didn't have time to put these tomatoes aside. Camille said and quickly took out a notebook in which she wrote down the spoiled vegetables. The girl held out her notes to Nancy. The businesswoman took a quick look at the notebook and spoke in a stern voice. All this will be deducted from your wages. And now these tomatoes can be taken to your home. How's that? And yesterday's game was cucumbers. I gave them to you. Are you going to take them out of my paycheck too? But that's not fair. Almost crying, said the girl. It's not for me to teach you how to work with goods. You did not rush to me, so you should do your job. If you see that you have a spoilage of this or that kind of vegetables, you try to block it. From this day on, you are responsible for all spoiled tomatoes, cucumbers, and so on. Camille was walking home after a day's work in high spirits. As soon as she entered the apartment, Evelyn approached her and raised her index finger to her lips. That meant it was worth talking in a whisper. It meant it was worth talking in whispers since Vanessa was asleep. The old woman, seeing Camille in a bad mood, immediately realized that the girl was in trouble. She asked Camille to go to the kitchen and asked her what was wrong. The girl took out the tomatoes and put them on the table. And only then she told what had happened. And at the end of her narrative, she added, I don't know how to weigh people. I am ashamed to do it. I will not hide that I add a few grams somewhere. I was advised to do so by a neighbor who sells nearby. But how can I answer the customers if I have a kilogram of tomatoes, for example, will rot? Do not be upset. From work a month and see what salary you get. If it will be pennies, then there's nothing to stay there. A month went by and an audit was done. Nancy informed Camille that there was a shortage and told her the amount. The girl was already ready for it, so without too many questions the businesswoman offered to deduct the shortage. Then she informed Nancy that she was no longer working for her. The next day, Camille again went to look for work at the market where she worked. The girl did not want to go, and that was one reason not to go out with Nancy. Camille decided that it was possible to find a position as a vendor at the bazaar, which was a few stops away from her home. The girl remembered Evelyn's advice, and so she wanted to get a job selling peace goods. Camille was lucky right away. She saw several advertisements at the entrance to the market for sellers. Camille approached one employer, and he said he would be happy to hire her. The girl immediately asked about the salary, and the man voiced the amount. Camille has been drinking since morning, looked at the entrepreneur, and said that this is paltry money. The employer smirked and said, I do not know you, my dear, so there will be a trial period. If we work out, well, in the sense that there will be no shortages, then in a couple of months your salary will increase. That's what all the entrepreneurs do around here. Maybe you should check it out. The girl sighed dejectedly and agreed to the man's proposal. 
And then she went on to look at the other seller's merchandise. It was only when Camille walked a little farther away that she was stopped by a woman who was selling toys. The stranger spoke up. I heard that you are tuning up for work. Well, I can tell you that all these entrepreneurs promise to raise wages after a while, but not all of them keep their promises. Are you saying that the man I hired will cheat me too? I don't know anything about him. I'm talking about me. I've been working here for about four months now, and I've had no complaints. And I was promised a raise. They're still giving me a raise. I'm out of options, so I'm going to have to take my chances and work for this man. Camille left the market after talking to the saleswoman and went to the bus stop. The girl felt disappointed that things were going wrong for her. She thought she would find a job where she would get a great salary, but everything turned out to be exactly the opposite. Soon the bus pulled up. The girl entered the transportation and sat down on the empty seats, but two girls were already sitting against her and talking animatedly. Camille, to distract herself from bitter thoughts, involuntarily began to listen to the dialogue of strangers. Initially, Camille realized that they were two former classmates who had met after a while and were discussing their peers who were in the same class. Soon Camille got tired of listening to the girls and wanted to turn her attention to the view from the window. So she heard what the brunette said, addressing her interlocutor. Do you remember Miranda from our class, who always wore her older sister's clothes? We used to make fun of her for it all the time. You wouldn't believe it. I saw her the other day at the coffee shop where I was sitting with my son. I was stunned at how Katya looked originally. I didn't even believe it was her. I called out her name. Miranda smiled at me and moved to the table next to me. I stared at her with my mouth hanging open. It was a luxurious girl, which is immediately obvious that she visits expensive beauty salons. About the way she is dressed, I'm not talking at all. She has fashionable pants, a suit of such a coastal color, and a that to it in sandals. Practically on all fingers descendants and a gold ring. If in general to say, then in front of me was a stylish girl who knows her own price. Katya, whom we knew as the poorest in school. Probably married well, replied the person I was talking to. But you are wrong, she is not married and is not even in a hurry. Then how did she succeed in life? The second girl asked perplexed. This was curious for me too, and I asked her about it. Miranda answered that she earns money with her body. She said it so simply that I was very sweet of her answer. I asked her if doing it for money is disgusting. The answer was simple. Miranda said that now she can afford what she wants to do. And as for whether it is disgusting or not, she said that she treats it like a job. I was taken aback by this news. I don't even have the words to describe it. And further Camille did not hear what the brunette said in response, because after the lecturer announced Camille's stop, the girl got off the bus and went home, thinking about the conversation between the two former classmates. Just then, the young woman saw a bench and sat down on it. She thought about this Miranda who earns money this way. Camille sat for a while as a call came from her neighbor. Wendy reported that Evelyn had become ill and had been rushed to the hospital. Then the neighbor added that Vanessa was at her place. Camille rose abruptly from the bench and ran home. The young woman immediately went to her, where she learned that Evelyn suddenly felt pain in her chest and called Wendy. She in turn called an ambulance and the older woman was hospitalized. Camille was frightened. She was worried about the pensioner's condition. Camille called the hospital to find out how Evelyn was doing, but I answered that the woman was now in intensive care and all answers would not be available until the next day. Camille slumped down in her chair after the call. She already realized that tomorrow she would not go to any work because Vanessa had no one to leave her with. And also the girl realized that the pensioner would need medicine which means that she would need finances. All these thoughts made the young woman cry. She was well aware that there was nowhere to go for help at the moment. The next day, Camille put her daughter in the stroller and went to the hospital. Camille mentally asked the Almighty to make Evelyn feel better. The girl was very afraid of losing her dear person. And here it was not that the old woman helped financially, 
but in another way, that the pensioner supported Camille morally and did not let her be discouraged. Soon Camille was already sitting in the hospital room opposite Evelyn, who had already been brought back from intensive care. The girl stroked the elderly woman's hand and asked her to hold on. The pensioner smiled at the ward and replied, To me, don't worry, I made it through. But how will you be now? Alone, we are slowly leaving. I have an idea. Let's call your son to come here. It would be nice for you to see him. You're going about it the wrong way, sweetheart. I'm not going to die, so let your son come here when he gets a chance. And if you're implying that you're asking him for financial help, forget it. My son is having a hard time too. He's paying a mortgage. And he has three kids to feed, clothe, and shoe. All right. All right. Calm down. I didn't mean to ask him for help. I just thought it would do you good to see your son and get you back on your feet. The turkey thought I was screwed too. He said sternly. And the woman. And then she said more softly, All right. I knew you meant what you said out of the goodness of your heart. You'd better tell me that your job is going great. They said you'd be out in a week. So you have exactly one week to rest and get back into action, said Camille Savrasov. Having worked soon, Camille returned home with her daughter after the hospital. The young woman played with Utah for a while and then fed her and put her to bed. Afterward, she sat down on the couch and thought about her deception about Evelyn's job. Camille suddenly realized that she had not just told a lie to the older woman. It had been done intentionally. Camille had made the decision even then that she would go to the track to earn money. The realization that she would be selling her body no longer frightened the girl. Camille realized that she simply had no way out. It would be possible to go to work as a salesman but the young woman already knew that she lacked the so-called salesmanship. This meant that Camille would have to pay for shortages or damaged goods. You could also work as a dishwasher, but it paid a pittance, and the other girl was not given, as there was no appropriate education, and so Camille decided to go to the highway. After a while, Evelyn was discharged from the hospital. The pensioner was taken away by Camille and her daughter. The girl fondly hugged the old woman and said that she would not allow her to be sick anymore. Evelyn smiled at her ward's words and promised. Evelyn smiled at her mentee's words and promised not to do it at all. A few more days passed after the discharge of the pensioner. Camille informed the elderly woman that she was going to work tomorrow. Evelyn asked the girl what her job was. Camille thought for a while and replied, How can I put it to you so you understand? Basically. I have to go around the world. Basically, I have to go to businesses and collect signatures. Why collect them? I won't tell you yet, because it's gonna be a rotating assignment every few days. But the upside is that I'll be paid by the number of signatures, which means as soon as I complete the assignment, we'll have the money. That's a weird job. It's the first time I've heard of such a job. The older woman said perplexed. There's nothing strange about it. We are not living in the Stone Age after all. There are many specialties now that you have never even heard of. I'm not going to argue with you. You'd better tell me everything after the first day of work. So Camille is getting ready for work. Evelyn is puzzled and asks the mentees why the working day starts so late and the time was around 15 o'clock. Camille quickly finds an answer and says that at this time, people are better in contact and therefore the opportunity to collect more signatures increases, and then the girl added that this way she could earn more money. After a while Camille stood on the highway. She, so that the pensioner did not guess anything, bought a mini skirt and a blouse with a deep neckline in advance. In all these clothes the girl changed before going out on the highway. And here already Camille stands on the road and waits for the truck. Initially, cars stopped in front of her, and the drivers offered Camille a ride. However, the girl immediately decided that she needed chauffeurs who work as truckers. She herself did not understand why this decision came to her mind, and soon a truck slowed down in front of Camille. A man's head peeked out of the cab. The driver evaluated the girl and offered her a ride. Camille smiled 
and got into the driver's cab. The man once again looked at her traveling companion and said, You must be new here, because I haven't seen you here before. And you? I see that you are already a regular here, if you know everyone, said the girl, trying to say so that her voice did not shake from excitement. However, the man as if caught her inner state. And so he asked you are obviously going to do this case for the first time. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. I know the rates and I will pay even a little more than what is required. After a while Camille was already out of the cab. The young woman adjusted her skirt and at the same moment heard a man shouting to her that she was gorgeous and that he would like to meet her again. The girl reluctantly waved him off and walked slowly down the road. At the moment, Camille felt dirty. She couldn't stand the urge to shower to wash off the stranger's touch. But Camille forced herself to think about the fact that this was just a job that would help her and not live. The young woman came home. Already as before the evening, Evelyn looked anxiously at the ward. But the latter smiled amiably and said that there was the first earnings and handed the pensioner the money. The old woman looked at the money and frightenedly said, wow, a decent amount for one working day. Today was just a lucky day. There was only one task that needed to be done today. So I tried to collect more signatures. I had to visit a lot of different agencies, but it was worth it. I don't like you coming home alone so late. You're a girl who knows what can happen. You better get fewer signatures and come home earlier. You know, there's a popular wisdom that you can't make all the money you want. That goes for you. We'll see. And now we should be happy that we have finances, and we will be able to buy, not a crib, so that the child sleeps not in a stroller. I'm also very tired as I've been walking a lot. So can I take a shower and go to bed? Evelyn offered the girl to eat first, and then already take hygienic procedures. But Camille refused. The young woman wanted to actually take a shower and just forget about what she had done today of her own free will. As soon as Camille got to the bed and Evelyn, who had stayed with her tonight because Camille had come home late, was lying next to her, she felt ashamed. The landlady turned to the pensioner in a whisper and apologized for the late visit. The guest stroked her ward in response and asked her not to worry about nothing. Only after these words Evelyn Camille calmly sighed. Immediately, she was struck by an electric shock. She realized that, doing such work, she had not thought about the most important thing, that she could get pregnant. Camille immediately decided that she would buy birth control tomorrow. The next day, Camille didn't go anywhere. What surprised the pensioner? The elderly woman asked why Camille had the day off today. The girl laughed in response and said that she would not have a job every day. Camille could not admit to Evelyn that today she simply did not want to go to the track, as there was still a residue on her soul from the way she had earned the money. It had been two days since Camille had given pleasure to the driver of the truck. It was only after that that the young woman decided to go out on the highway again. It was not an easy decision for her, and it was as if felt by Evelyn, who asked the girl where her office with the management was located. Camille realized that if she didn't make a precise schedule of the so-called work, the pensioner would sound the alarm and start to find out everything herself. So Camille decided that from this day forward, she would go out to the track once every three days. Camille had already been working in this way for two weeks. During that time, the girl bought her daughter a crib. Camille realized that she could not go on like this forever and she comforted herself with the fact that it was only until her daughter grew up a little. And then the girl planned to give Anya to the kindergarten and herself to enroll in correspondence studies at the institute. And so Camille once again went out on the highway. She was waiting for a truck and at the same time remembered the movie Pretty Woman. She liked this movie very much. The girl imagined herself in the role of the main character and dreamed that she would one day happen in her life. She wanted to meet a prince on a white horse, who will pull her out of the swamp and will love not only her, but also Anya that. However, the young woman understood that this will not happen as it only happens in movies, where the plot is invented to interest the viewer, and yet the girl still dreamed about it, 
realizing that it would not happen to her. Reflections and the girl was interrupted by a stopped car. Camille looked into the car and from horror the whole transport belonged to the husband of her neighbor. And this meant that now the man would start asking unnecessary questions about what she was doing on the highway. And in fact, the car door opened and the neighbor looked out and said in surprise Camille, I didn't expect to see you here. What are you doing here? My wife told me you got a job. That's right, Wendy. But it's my day off. And here I am waiting for a young man. Let's just say I have a date. I'll ask you not to tell your spouse about this. She'll be asking me all kinds of questions. That's right. Laughing, the man said. And then he added my Wendy. Curious person wants to know everything about everyone. Only that you chose a meeting with your boyfriend in a not very convenient place. Yeah, I already realized that. As soon as the neighbor left, Camille breathed a sigh of relief. She'd expected a lot more questions from Wendy's husband. And there weren't many. Now the girl was only worried that the neighbor would not tell about their encounter on the road. Camille knew very well that Wendy often met with Evelyn and could tell the elderly woman that Camille was standing on the highway. And if the old woman found out about it, she wouldn't let up until she knew the whole truth. Camille, on the other hand, absolutely did not want Evelyn to know the way she made her money. A few days passed. Camille was once again standing on the highway, waiting for a truck. And then a beautiful black jeep stopped in front of her. Two big guys jumped out of the cabin, who picked up the girl under the elbows and quickly pushed her into the car. The young woman did not even have time to shout, as she was already in the jeep. And here an obese man turned to her from the front seat, who looked at her carefully and then asked her how long she had been doing this. Camille was startled and said she did not know what he was talking about. Her phrase made the stranger angry, and he spoke harshly. You don't make a pie girl of yourself here. This is my territory. And I have already been informed that there is a young lady who works without taxes. And as it turns out, this young lady is you. So let's be honest. Otherwise, my boys are gonna have a different conversation with you. Camille, looking at the stranger, clearly realized that it was not worth lying to this man because he would keep his word. The girl admitted that she had been out on the track for a little less than a month and immediately added that she didn't do it every day. Hearing the young woman's retort, the man nodded contentedly. Then he said softly, My name is Sam. Now I see that you're telling the truth and you're a good girl because you figured it out the first time. Now listen to what I have to say. You work on my territory, which means I have to pay tax to the treasury, like any decent citizen. But the treasury for you will not be the state, but my pocket. And in general, on the first of every month, you will bring me a sum of money to my address. If you don't, you realize you'll be dealing with my boys sitting next to you. Now tell me what you got. I've got you scared, the girl muttered fearfully. That's great. It's a pleasure doing business with you, said the man and handed Camille a piece of paper on which was written an address and a sum of money. Camille looked at the entry and the window and then said, but, but this is a large sum. It's almost half of what I'll earn in a month and who has an easy life these days. You see, I'm not an unemployment fund. I want to eat good food too. And if you don't like this amount, go work at the factory as a laborer. I didn't force you to go to the highway, so you decide what's good for you. Anyway, this is a short conversation. Either you pay or you're out of here. And I'm waiting for your decision right now. Okay, I'll do it. After that, the young woman was allowed out of the car. And as soon as Camille left the car, the jeep drove off. Camille looked after the car and tears rolled down her cheeks. She realized that from now on, she would have to pay back almost half of the money she had earned. After this conversation, the young woman decided that today she would not work. After a while the girl was already at home. She entered the apartment and saw the surprised face of the pensioner, who asked why she did not come so early. Camille glumly replied that the day had not gone well and there were no errands to run. Evelyn looked at the girl carefully and said sternly, 
Don't tell me fairy tales here. Tell me what really happened. I've known you for years, and I can see that you're worried. Camille was about to tell me the truth about where and how she made her money. But then she looked at Evelyn. She felt ashamed to tell the old woman. The girl collected the pensioner again and wrote tall tales that she had not been paid for her assignment today. Evelyn Inquisitive looked at the interlocutor and helped. I hope you are not deceiving me. And about the fact that they paid, I understand that it's frustrating. But you can't be too upset about it. Every job has a slip-up. You had one. All right, calm down. Come on, I'll feed you and tell you how we fought the duck today. After Evelyn's words, the girl sighed with relief that the conversation on a dangerous topic was over. And then together with the pensioner went to the kitchen, where she listened to the elderly woman, who enthusiastically told how she spent the day sonnets. The next day Camille felt ill. She had a fever and a sore throat. Camille realized she had a cold. The young woman wrote about herself as she realized that it was impossible to be sicker now. After all, it was urgent to earn money to pay tribute to the track. Soon, Evelyn arrived at Camille's house and immediately announced that the labor activity would cease for the time being. Camille, as soon as she heard this with a sad smile, said that these were the words she had expected from Evelyn. In response, she said, don't think I'm such a predictable madam. I'll call a doctor and persuade the doctor to put you in the hospital. You don't have to do that. You're a doctor. So treat me with us agreed, but only sick. You will follow all my instructions. With a smile said at Evelyn, specifically addressing daddy's ward Camille, recovered. Seven days later she wanted to go to work again, but she was prevented from doing so by a pensioner. The elderly woman said that Camille had not yet recovered from her illness and needed to stay at home for a couple more days. There was nothing left for the girl to do, only to agree with Evelyn's decision. Two days later Camille was already standing on the highway. She was thinking about how to raise the necessary amount for Wendy. The young woman realized that she was not ready to go to work every day, but she also realized that it was necessary to give the money. And then one solution came to her mind, that one day it was necessary to double the number of clients, and only she thought about it, as a truck stopped in front of her. The girl climbed into the cab and closed the door and then turned to the driver. Immediately with fear, she faintly shuddered. In front of her sat the man who had robbed her of her innocence. The young woman only wanted to get out of the car. As the young man menacingly ordered her not to move from her seat and in doing so grabbed her arm, Camille expelled and asked Stephen to let her go. The guy grinned and said that she had willingly got into the vehicle and then added that you were a pious lady offering your services on the highway. And at that time you did not make a road out of yourself. Well, let's see what you have managed to learn during this time. I can't wait to reminisce with an old acquaintance who picked up during this time of experience. They're gonna let me out of the car. And don't even think that I'm going to have fun with you, and you shouldn't shame me, since it's only to your credit that I'm out here on the highway making a living. You're the one who took my virginity against my will, and I got pregnant afterward. I have a young daughter who needs food, diapers, skates, etc., and my allowance isn't very high. And you knew I was an orphanage kid with no one to stand up for me. So you used your power that day. I hate you. Are you telling me you had my baby? That's an unexpected twist. Don't tell me you want to get child support from me now. You make money on the highway. Somebody got you pregnant, Stephen said defiantly. Even though you're the biological father of the child, I can assure you that we don't need your money. You can choke on your finances and the fact that you have a daughter you can forget forever. And let's stop this stupid conversation. There's only one thing I don't understand right now. I mean, you're such a big shot. And you work as a trucker. That doesn't make sense. Okay, I don't want to waste my time with you. Let me get out of the car. I can't take care of myself. Camille tried to open the door of the truck, but she was pulled to her by Stephen Force and tried to lift her skirt. The girl screamed in desperation and began to fight back. 
At that moment, a voice came from behind them. It was a man speaking to the driver. Let her go right now. What are you doing? Partner, you know I like to have fun with the girls on the road. Stephen said in a perplexed voice. You'll find another girl on the way. The man replied. Christopher, you're my partner, but in this case I don't understand you, said Stephen, and let the girl go. In the meantime, Camille glanced back and looked at the protector. He was a handsome middle-aged man who looked her straight in the eye. The girl nodded gratefully and started to open the door of the truck, but she was called by her partner Stephen. The young woman looked back and glanced questioningly at the man. At that moment he took out a purse and took out some bills, which he immediately handed to Camille with the words, This is enough for you and the little girl for the first time, and try to change your trade. It doesn't suit you. You'd better find another way to make money. Now go home to your daughter, who's sure to miss you. But I can't take the money. Just like that, Camille said. You can. Take it and go. If I see you on the road again, they'll think you're a fallen woman, Christopher said sternly. The young woman took the money and nodded gratefully once more and quickly got out of the car. As soon as the young woman left the cab, the truck started at the same moment. Camille looked at the car and thought about the stranger's words. Camille stood for a while longer and then headed home. The girl thought that there was only one trouble for today. It was the meeting with Stephen, but she was wrong. Camille had just arrived home, so she saw that her neighbor was visiting. Camille said hello to her, but she said nothing and hurried away to her room. The girl looked at her neighbor with a puzzled look. Then she turned to Evelyn. What's the matter with Wendy? I came in and she just ran off. She didn't even say hello, and I thought we'd had no quarrel with her. The pensioner didn't say a word in response. The old woman asked if she had earned it today. Camille girl with a smile replied that she received a good sum for work and with these words began to take out her purse to show her finances. Camille took out the money and handed it to Evelyn with words here take at least part of it. I suggest that tomorrow we go to the market together and buy some goodies. How about it? The pensioner approached the girl and took the money. The old woman studied the bills for a long time and then asked her mockingly what was Camille's task today. Camille immediately sensed a trick in Evelyn's question. She answered that today she was collecting signatures for the advertisement. The old woman laughed and then with a sharp movement threw the money in the face of her ward with the words, who did you decide to deceive? And after this phrase, the pensioner snatched from Camille's hands a bag from which to shake out the clothes. Evelyn picked up the fallen short skirt from the floor, as well as a blouse with a deep neckline. The older woman held out the clothes to the girl and said reproachfully, this is your uniform. When you collect signatures from truckers, don't give me any more fairy tales. Wendy saw you today, driving down the highway with her husband. A neighbor told me you were wearing those clothes when you got into the truck. She also told me that her husband had seen you on the road before. By the way, he's been getting the same shit from you. That you were on a date. How could you do something like that? Tell me. Don't you hate what you're doing? Can you imagine what your daughter will think of you when she finds out? I'm ashamed of what you're doing right now. It's like you stabbed me in the back. I didn't expect you to deceive me like that. You. Evelyn shoved things into Camille's hands. Camille and silently went to the kitchen, where she sat down at the table and not in a coffin and cried softly. Camille came in after her and tried to hug the older woman, but the latter pushed her away. The girl realized that she had caused her dear one unbearable heartache. She wanted to say something in her defense, but there were no words. Camille knelt down in front of Evelyn and spoke loudly. It's my fault, and I admit it. I know I have offended you very much and I have nothing to say for myself. Believe me, I did not go to the track for my own pleasure, but only to survive. Just don't pretend you're poor. There are plenty of single moms who find a way to make ends meet and they don't go selling their bodies. Like you did, scold me with tears in my eyes directly killed Camille. I won't tell you anything else. I'll just leave now and try to forget that I ever met you. Small pennies. I'll pay you back. 
but we won't see each other anymore. And you can continue to go out for signatures on the highway, said the old woman and got up from the table. She wanted to take a step, but could not, for her knees were encompassed by Camille, who cried sobbing profusely. For a few minutes the girl held Evelyn by the legs and then raised her face to the pensioner, and through her sobs said, You may scold me with hurtful words. I bear it all. Just don't cut us out of your life. I promise you, on my knees, that I will never go out on the highway again. I don't know how I'll make a living yet, but believe me, I'll find a way. Just give me one chance. I beg you not to turn your back on us. You know very well that you're the only person we have close to us. I've only now realized what I can't lose. Believe me, I'm truly sorry for what I did. But I did not know how to get out of such a situation, when there is no money, sometimes even for bread. I just ask you to believe that the money I brought today, it was not earned in this way. It was given to me by a stranger who saved me from Stephen. And that man gave me a good admonition too, that if he ever sees me on the highway again, he will consider me a fallen woman. He said the right words to you. All right, baby, if you promise me it won't happen again, we'll stick together. We'll try to forget this month completely, like it never happened. Now go see your daughter. I think she's awake. Quietly spoke the old woman and stroked the girl's head. In the evening of that day when the Evelyn players had already left, Camille thought about life. She realized that she had made a promise to the pensioner. And the girl knew that she would keep her word in any case, even if she had to starve. And at the moment Camille was concerned with another question. Where to find a part-time job? Camille spent a long time in her thoughts, and when she looked at the clock, she was surprised that already at zero o'clock the young woman came to her daughter and admired the baby. Then the girl shared the bed and lay down. And at that moment for some reason she remembered the departure of her neighbor. Now Camille understood why Wendy had treated her so dryly. Camille decided that she had to talk to the neighbor tomorrow. Ten days passed. Camille kept her promise to Bevelyn. Now when the pensioner came to Camille, the girl went to look for a job. And soon she was lucky to get a job as a dishwasher in a kindergarten. The salary was small, but Camille was happy with the money, and the schedule suited her. Another week flew by and Camille had a day off. The young woman decided to take her child for a walk at lunchtime. She had already started to get things to dress A. The doorbell rang. Camille was surprised by it as she was not expecting anyone. And especially Evelyn knew that she had a day off today and did not come these days. The girl then thought that was right. A neighbor came over to chat and hurriedly opened the door. However, it was not Wendy who turned out to be the evening, but a stranger who held a gorgeous bouquet of pink roses and a large fluffy bear. Camille looked at the man with surprise and immediately recognized him as the man who had given her money for nothing. The landlady was embarrassed to see Stephen's partner and spoke crumpled. Hello, you must be here for the debt. How did you find me? You have a way of keeping guests on the doorstep. I'm glad you remembered me though. That means you left a good impression of me. I'm not used to letting strangers into my home. Oh my goodness, the man exclaimed and then went on. We're the ones who don't know each other. Perhaps you don't remember my name, but I remember yours perfectly well because I heard your whole conversation with Stephen only after I heard what that man did to you that I did not let him do it again. My name is Christopher, by the way. I remember Stephen calling you Christopher. All right, come on in, but I'm warning you right away. I don't have the money to pay you back at the moment. And one more thing, I don't do that trade anymore. If you'd like to collect your debt in this equivalent, I gave the money freely and from the bottom of my heart. I really wanted you to stop doing this business, said the man and handed the girl flowers and a toy, and then crossed the threshold. But I don't understand why you came to me. The young woman asked in surprise. That's an interesting question, but I will answer you now. Initially agree that you will not call me you, otherwise I feel like an old man. I'm only 31 years old. Now to answer your question. 
When I saw you in the car, I was struck by your looks. Then I thought you'd disappear and all my thoughts of you would be gone. But as time went on, I kept thinking about you. Then I realized that Cupid's arrow had accidentally pierced my heart. And thus I stand beside you. After these words, the crying of a child was heard from the room. The young woman rushed into the room. She put the flowers and the toy on the bed and picked up her daughter in her arms. Following the mistress of the apartment followed the guest. The man looked at the little girl and softly said, It seems to me that with a toy I hurried. You should have bought another set of rattles, since your daughter is still a baby. You shouldn't have bought anything at all. By the way, my daughter's name is Vanessa. She's five months old. I forgot to ask you how you found me. Stephen gave me a beautiful name. He gave me the street, the house, the entrance. I had to find the apartment on my own. Very interesting. Can you tell me why Stephen is a trucker? I mean, his father's not a poor man. I'd be happy to share. He told me why it happened. But first I'd like you to offer me a seat. That's what hospitable hostesses usually do. The man said with a smile. The young woman hummed with embarrassment and offered the guest a chair while she sat down on the bed with the baby. The girl turned to Christopher and looked questioningly at the man. The guest realized that he was expected to answer and so began his story from the narration of the new acquaintance. The landlady learned that Stephen's father's business had failed and had to take a large loan from the bank to restore his own business. However, the finances did not help. Eventually the business went bust and there was a debt to the bank. And then it was decided to sell Stephen's apartment to pay off the debt. The young man's father could not bear it all and died suddenly. Stephen was left without money for life and he had nothing to pay for his studies at the institute. So the guy dropped out of college and got a job as a trucker. Christopher told all this while looking at Camille, who was listening attentively. When the man finished the story, the girl smiled mysteriously, which did not hide from the guest. And he asked you must be gloating. Not at all. I just think that Stephen will now understand how to live on a simple salary and not boast about daddy's money. You're right about that. Stephen is the sole earner in the family now, since his mother never worked after marrying his father. And from what I understand, my partner's mom isn't going to do it. But I'm not interested in that anymore. Me neither. We were gonna go for a walk. Go with the duck. You won't mind that. So you're gonna tell me about yourself. And soon the couple and the baby were walking in the park. Christopher told the girl he lived in a one-room apartment. He has been working as a trucker for six years. He likes this occupation and also said that he was married. But the family life did not work out. He said that he likes to guess Japanese crossword puzzles and dreams of visiting the Northern Territory in the future. Hearing the man's last wish, Camille laughed and said, everyone wants to go to the South, but you want to go to the North. You are strange. It's very simple. My parents are from there and they often talk about it. If only you could hear how enthusiastically my mother and father describe the North. Why am I telling you this now? I'll get to know them. You'll hear it firsthand. What makes you think I'm going to meet them? Wait a minute. Don't be so quick to say no. It's not like I'm asking you to get into bed. I just want to start by courting you. And if everything turns out well, then we can create a family with you in the future. From the lack of the young man with a laugh uttered Camille. The couple walked with the child for a while. And then Christopher walked the girl home helped her carry the stroller to the third floor and at parting asked permission to call and visit. The girl responded to the young man with consent. A month passed as Christopher visited Camille for the first time. During this time, the couple met several times. They often called each other. The man always inquired about Vanessa's accomplishments to the young woman at each call. It was a pleasure. It didn't take long to fly by. Another month Camille came home from work and was surprised to hear someone in her apartment speaking in a man's voice. She listened and recognized Christopher's voice. The girl went into the room and saw the man talking sweetly with Evelyn. The old woman saw the girl 
and said with a smile that Camille had come to visit them. Camille looked at Christopher with surprise, and he immediately knelt down on one knee in front of Camille, took out a small box from the pocket of his jeans, which he opened and handed to the girl with the words, Here I am making you a marriage proposal. I met Evelyn without your permission and told this worthy woman how I love you. She said she would bless us only after you gave your consent. Now my fate is in your hands. Camille looked at Evelyn confused initially and then shifted her gaze to the man. The girl took a box from which she pulled out a thin wedding ring. She slipped the piece of jewelry onto her finger and admired it. Taking her hand aside, then looked at Christopher again and asked quietly, what about my job at the track? That's what you gave me, isn't it? You're going to remind me of that someday, aren't you? What kind of nonsense are you talking about? I believe I met you in a more romantic setting. Like the day I first walked into this apartment. Make it look like I got the wrong address. And by the way, Stephen is no longer my partner. I asked management to do that, and they'd gone along with it. Now I have a partner who is not considered for the girls. He's a model family man. That's what I'm going to be. As soon as you say yes, what can I tell you? Naturally, I say I want to be your wife, the girl said happily. And at the same moment she found herself in the arms of a man. Christopher tenderly kissed the young woman and quietly in her ear said, You have now made me with the happiest person. I love you madly and I will never hurt you or Anya. I will do everything possible so that you do not need anything. We will be a model family. And now you can't refuse to meet your relatives, who already know about you and are eagerly waiting for me to introduce you to them. I understand that you are preparing me to talk to my father and mother about the wonderful northern region, as well as hinting that we will have a joint trip to those lands. That's a good point. And you are not only beautiful, but also smart. Laughing. Christopher replied, and kissed the young woman on the lips. Subscribe and click the bell. A pedigree cat in good hands, age nine years. She's a mountain cat, eats premium dry food. Call the number. Maria shuddered. She was so struck by the photo of a white cat, which looked from the phone screen with the eyes of her favorite. The cat Churley, with whom the girl was inseparable since childhood, recently died, and the cat in the picture was incredibly like him. The girl read the ad again, then gazed at the image of the kitty, thought and dialed the indicated number. Hello, hello. I'm calling from the ad about your cat. I'd love to see her. You see, she looks just like my dead cat. You'd think we cloned him. Hello, you're welcome to visit us anytime. The woman on the other end of the line had a nice, low-pitched voice. I think you'll like my Marquesa. She's very smart. Maria noticed that the woman seemed sad or tired. It turned out to be a short drive right halfway to Maria's work. Arranged a time to meet. Maria didn't want to put things off and drove to the specified address right after work the very next day. A strange excitement swept over her, as if meeting someone else's cat was something special and decisive. When she found the right entrance, she stood for a minute, inhaled deeply and resolutely went inside. There was a tiny rug by the door of the red apartment. It was clean. She pressed the bell, and a very thin woman of small stature opened the door. Good evening. It's me, Maria. You remember from the ad? Yes, of course. Come in, please. I invited a guest. The woman walked forward. Maria noted that her gait was not firm, like a completely alive person an underground atom of the corridor, passed into the room. In a small apartment of the old type stood hospital sterility and emptiness. No furniture, no appliances hung on the chairs or scattered clothes not personal without girls or those not too necessary things, which and promulu dwelling coziness. Even the curtains on the windows looked poor and temporary. From some cheap and frivolous matter, this house would appear uninhabitable. If his mistress in a white kerchief had not sat down opposite Maria on a small sofa, having previously made an inviting gesture not without shyness. Maria looked at her, that looked haggard bloodless face, as if the countenance from an icon make yourself comfortable, 
said meanwhile the woman I, Adriana. And here is our Marquise. She led her hand to Maria, immediately at the entrance, already saw this incredible picture. The large white cat was sitting on the only chair by the sofa where the hostess and Maria were sitting. She looked like a majestic statue. The void around it especially enhanced the impression. The cat looked at the girl, studying at first, and then shifted her gaze to the woman in the headscarf, as if demanding an explanation from her. Maria, too, was scrutinizing Marquise. Hello, Marquise, she said. Quiet. You are very beautiful. Tears came to her eyes and the girl was silent. Adriana nodded understandingly, pulling herself together. Maria turned to her. Are you leaving or? She smiled sadly, but it could be taken that way. She remained silent for a moment. It was evident that the explanation was not easy for her. I love her very much, but Adriana slowly pulled the headscarf off her head and exposed a completely smooth skull. Oncology. The last course of chemotherapy was in vain. There's no point in having surgery. Not six months left. Maria, stunned, remained silent. That's why her voice is so awful, her face so pale. That's what the scarf hides. What can I say? You know, I've grown tired of the thought. Adriana went on. Is it true that one gets used to everything? At first, the news is like a lightning strike, and then you have to get on with your life. You can't go to the coffin alive. She grinned bitterly. The two women felt sympathy for each other from the first words and continued to talk about some unimportant things. Strangers seemed to have nothing in common, but two lonely people needed warm companionship. Meanwhile, Marquise jumped from her chair and approached them, lost her feet Adriana, then raised her muzzle to Maria and flashed. Friends, Adriana predicted and smiled. But you know, Maria, it's complicated. I think you'll understand. I have to go to the hospital soon. Until then, I'd like to keep Marcus with me for two weeks. Do you mind? And you'll come over after work. You'll get used to each other. Of course I don't mind. Let him stay, of course. Maria left to visit her new friend and her cat during the agreed time. She was anxious, but at the same time lightened up after this meeting. This evening filled her with memories. With all her heart sympathizing with Adriana, she involuntarily compared her fate with someone else's. Thought of loneliness. The girl realized that attachment to an animal is not a bliss, not the whim of a sick person. Her cat Shirley, who had literally grown up with her in her old age, had become quite infirm. Coming in the evening from the realtor's office, where she worked as a lawyer to formalize transactions, Maria, sadly looking into his sad eyes, watched almost human clumsy movements, his paws, which so and wanted to call pedagogical. And no vitamins could help him anymore. Veterinarian, to which Maria in despair took the pet, only sympathetically sighed and offered well Davabushka. Your cat is still long-lived. I am not God, and give him a second life cannot, but to alleviate his suffering can. He cast a glance at Maria, whose eyes rolled involuntary tears. It'll be easier for you. One injection, and the patient will go into a soft, eternal sleep. Believe me, it's the best thing we can do for him. Maria refused. She walked home. The two of them stoically endured the difficult months, without words understanding each other. The cat lay there exhausted, not wanting to eat. He wouldn't eat. Only his gaze was understanding or goodbye. The girl cried, turning away. She was sure that Fluff would feel her despair if she showed him her tears. And one evening, when the mistress came home, found her fluffy. The comrade had already calmed down for good. As if he tried to ease the suffering of his mistress. Maria spared neither strength nor time to take the fragmented and lost soft on the left pet's body to a distant abandoned house to bury him near her favorite lilac bushes, where once long ago they had spent many happy hours with the whole family. She was left all alone. The girl was coming back from the half-destroyed fence of the old daksha, limping a little and talking to herself. Now there was no one to talk to. We have to do something, we have to live somehow somebody's cat and somebody's best friend. It's not my fault I'm alone. I've got to live. So talking to herself, she reached the entrance, where the train stopped under the clatter of wheels and conversations. She looked out the dirty window and decided to take the cat. 
In the province, a lonely person can be seen at once. Neighbors know almost everything about him, everyone in sight. The fate of a loner in a big city is unenviable, especially if the character of the person is peculiar. Maria was a kind and intelligent girl, but a childhood trauma left her with a slight, almost imperceptible literacy on one leg. And here with this complex, she never managed to cope in the distant youth of a romantic young lady. She had the misfortune to fall in love with a kid from the neighborhood Ethan, black hair and swarthy. He looked like a gypsy. He had incredible charm. They call it charisma nowadays. He was a gung-ho, desperate soccer player. A couple of yard games have not left yet, and Maria could stealthily watch the boys, pretending that she was interested in the game and not one of the players. Girlfriends and petite boys were squealing, yelling. Maria, too, was in this crowd of admirers and caught Ethan's every move. Dark-skinned bodies took off in a run. The boy's supple torso was a source of admiration. Ethan was always surrounded by a crowd of younger kids. He was their idol. I don't know his character or his habits. Ethan. Maria fell in love just with his appearance so lively, filled with vitality, boyish face with dark eyebrows, was thin and spiritualized. In moments of play or lively conversation, Maria wanted to stare at him and just admire him. She stood at the window overlooking Ethan's driveway for a long time, trying to track his exit and jump out as if to the neighboring department store for groceries, exactly at the moment when Ethan would approach her house. Too often, she started to get in the way of the boy. At 13, girls still do not know the sense of proportion. What can I do? Hey you. He called out to her one day. What's your name? Maria felt like she'd been doused with ice water. That's the moment when the boy he adored noticed her. But as he noticed, just her temple. She was the one who ran straight home and didn't even cry. Only stopped looking in Ethan's direction. After that, the girl would run through the yard as quickly as possible. If there was a soccer game, Maria never let herself think about men again. Complexes acquired in adolescence often remain in a person for life. Her parents were a late child, and they looked upon her as a child. Not really that, delving into her mental space, her childhood crush remained unnoticed by anyone. And brought up on books, Maria closed herself off in a cozy hallway of music and novels of household chores near her mother. Daughter, don't you want to go to the movies? Her mother Wendy asked her. And our savings bank girls told us a new movie is going on. People are coming in droves. Being aware of the news from her young colleagues, the old lady began to worry that her daughter was always alone. She felt somewhat guilty about the time Maria fell off her bike and hurt her leg. Although Wendy and her husband had then done everything possible for their daughter her mother's heart ached. Of course, the blame for the aftermath fell entirely on the doctors who sent them home after surgery and treatment, saying it would all go away in time. Working out, sea, sun, and good nutrition will help. The elderly couple took their daughter to the sea as they lived frugally and could spend for the sake of her health, and nutrition was out of the question. All the best, Maria. All in all, Maria was the one unique flower in the family garden. Wendy herself married quite late for the daughter still and the girl's daughter spoke parents for their good modest accountant, who until 40 years old took care of his sick mother and remained single. The new family took shape. The spouses were completely satisfied with each other. The birth of a daughter was a happiness, unexpected and almost unreal. Therefore, Maria father unconditionally just adored and Wendy even allowed herself to dream of grandchildren. Having successfully graduated from the law school of the local university, Maria began to work, changed several places. She took root, oddly enough, in a noisy and crowded real estate company, helping employees and clients in drawing up documents and guiding them through the authorities. Screening girls, young young boys running through the office, were workmates, but nothing more. Maria was like something out of the last century. Big gray eyes, dark waves, hair and a tall, slender figure. But the main thing, of course, was in her main movements and manner of holding herself, as if she had just stepped out of a picture of the life of counts and countesses. Hence the coldness and restraint of her kept her from coming too near. She was always on a first-name basis with people. 
At arm's length, the life of the family flowed peacefully and softly. Parents very quickly one after another departed into the next world. Very modest, inconspicuous people who carried their responsibilities all their lives as they should. And when they grew old, just as obediently and peacefully passed away one after another, as if they were tied. So Maria stayed with Pushkin and lived quietly, not suffering from the lack of relatives and friends. After all, there was a good friend from early childhood and gave her their warmth and affection. Now she had a new relationship ahead of her. Maria ran to Adriana a day or two later. Hello, Adriana. It's Maria. Can I come by again tonight? She called before leaving her office. It was always like this. Rada treated her to tea from her meager stock. Maria, seeing the embarrassment of her new friend's position, brought her a little so as not to embarrass her. She was an excellent worker and earned quite well for her position. Deals were made a lot, despite the crises and cataclysms that abounded in the last 10 years and a good lawyer. Both clients and realtors appreciated, but each time the guest was convinced not in the horse's fodder. Adriana ate like a bird, and most often she had no appetite at all. The only food she accepted with joy was food for her favorite cat. Here Maria did not skimp on the most premium. Oh how timely just sprinkled her last Adriana's eyes lit up at the sight of a bag for Marquis. The woman immediately looked away in embarrassment, embarrassed by her poverty and not admitting to it. The Marquis should get used to me. Maybe she'll realize I'm not unhealthy and will accept food from me, Maria explained to her innkeeper smiling at Adriana. She didn't want to embarrass the sick. And where did you get such a gorgeous cat? She inquired. Adriana smiled weakly. It was evident that the memory pleased her. Oh, that's a very interesting story. She stretched out, and funny and reddish, and at the same time she was silent. Recovering in her memory the details of that long ago day, there was always music playing in our house. Parents were different. Sometimes they partied till they dropped. Sometimes my mom liked to cry, even cry, finding some far-fetched reasons. Mom had no reason to cry, I assure you, Maria. Daddy worshipped her, but mommy was a real Carmen. You know, hot, passionate, and terribly, terribly jealous. And my parents loved to go to the theater and were regulars at Philharmonic concerts. And dad had the misfortune to praise one of our local singers, she sang the main parts. She had a beautiful voice. Her name was Molly. Mom, of course, had to show her temper. She made a scene. It was only at home that my sister and I laughed. But Daddy wasn't laughing. It was Mom's way of asserting herself, you see. It may have looked silly from the outside, but Mommy knew what she was doing. Our intelligent, mild-mannered Daddy was also asserting his own importance. What about such a beautiful girl? His wife is jealous of him and even to whom the prima donna of the opera stage. It means that he is worth it. That means he's a real man. My God, how touching they were in their funny quarrels. And how did they make up afterward? Dad would sneak in a huge bouquet. Mom was starting to play the role of the perfect hostess who never was and suffered solely on Dad's orders. Adriana's bloodless face became lively at the telling of the story. It was felt that she was oblivious and distracted from her painful condition. Memories of her loved ones gave her strength. Only breathing was difficult. The woman took breaks to take a break from her emotional narrative. And then mom went quite far in her marital zeal, wanting to prove that she was ready to do anything for dad. Suddenly, she herself offered to approach that singer and present her with a bouquet. Dad was confused, but he couldn't contradict mom. You know, the husband's a tomboy. It's great for the family and the kids. After all, in the main daddy never conceded to anyone in the work in friendship. And in his love for mom, he was faithful. He acted only according to his beliefs and principles. And here they are mom, with an important look dad with a gorgeous bouquet go after the performance in the restroom of the actress. And there's not a single admirer at the door. Not even the most pathetic bouquet under the door, the actress in whose honor just exploded with applause. The hall sat in a corner, alone holding a cute little white kitty on her lap and wiping her tears. It turned out that the other day Molly leaves to her husband in Israel. Planned her benefit, 
but the wife of the chief director of mediocrity and envy of nice did not want Molly to receive a farewell ovation. She secretly warned all the servants of the theater who bribed, who simply frightened of dismissal, and the servants simply put the intended prima, bouquets, and baskets in the backyard. Not only that, intrigue, I hope, after the departure of Varshavskaya to get her role by intrigues, achieved the cancellation of the benefit actress, telling about it completely strangers to her people. Burst into tears on the shoulder of our mother and the daughter. My God, how is she? How are you? Yes, you are a golden voice, my dear mommy, hugged and sobbed with her. Daddy did not know how to calm this couple drowning in tears, but called someone from the closet and asked to bring champagne from the cupboard. When the parents came home at midnight and the best friend of the singer's mother, Antu Varshavsky, at her mother's arms, sat that same white kitty and left her living mascot, a new soulful friend so we had Marquis. Mommy with her inherent passion was raring to fight, and this time was supported by both Daddy and us. She arranged a grandiose scandal in the theater, disgraced the mean wife of the editor-in-chief for the whole city. But it was too late. Molly didn't leave from the community window. We loved her so much. You see how she's become just a Marquesa. Now she reminds us of three good people. Idea, who also recently passed away, and her parents. And this is why I love her so much and cherish Adriana Adriana. You could see it in her ever-changing breasts and that breathing. But her eyes were shining. A smile never left her lips. It was the first time I saw her so lively, almost cheerful, and I was glad of it. I can no longer provide her with the same care as before. Adriana repented. You see, Maria, it's empty. While I still have the strength to sell everything I had, I want to leave behind a vacant apartment so I don't have to go to the trouble of selling it. You have to face the truth. Are you a very strong person, Adriana? said Maria, lowering her eyes. Very decent. That's the whole story of our family, said Adriana. The family is gone and the story is over. Her pale lips even shifted slightly into the semblance of a smile. And my life will soon be over. I'd like to end it in a nice way you know, but nothing comes to mind. And I don't have the strength, let alone the means. Edward wanted to leave Andrew some money. He was worried about the apartment being so empty. But my boy well done, he didn't take it. He's too much of an honest, selfless man, like everyone else in the family. But I'm glad that at least my apartment will remain to my nephew, he will sell it anyway. To expand the housing in my town. It's probably the least I can do to thank him. A pure soul. How does he take care of me? He's been the only one who's kept me going these last few years. Isn't he going to move in with you? I asked Maria. He's still working after graduation. And to live with a sick aunt is not the greatest happiness. I'm even glad he won't have time to do it. The stuff and the apartment is all that. That's not the main thing. But I was so scared about Marcus. I love her more than anything in the world. She's a cat. The only creature dear to me. Marquise has been with me all through my illness. Can you imagine? She comforted me laid next to me on my sore spot after chemo. And when I was literally turned inside out, guarded me by the bathroom door, only calmed down when I crawled out of there powerless and delirious to the point of bed. And the hospital was waiting for me. Now I will be calm for my beautiful girl. You will certainly not offend her. The cat looked attentively at the two women and calmly lay in its usual place, as if it fully understood their conversation and sympathized with them. It smelled cozy and warm. Maria began to approach the cat more and more often, who was already allowing the stranger to pet herself. When people have little time to socialize and all the deadlines are shortened, they get closer much faster than in normal life. Adriana was in a hurry. She wanted to talk about her own. The young girl turned out to be a soulful and attentive listener. Gradually, she got to know Adriana's story completely. Young Adriana came to the city to study. She lived with her older sister and brother-in-law, who were already well settled here, working and raising a sweet son. Adriana adored her nephew's baby, and he reciprocated. But what can be said? But to sit on each other's heads in a small apartment of young spouses, and even with a small child was shameful. 
Six months later, Adriana moved into a student dormitory. Why are you leaving? Her sister resented her. Anna is as thin and white as Adriana. I have hot soup at home anytime. There's a balcony for you, please, Jacob, you tell her. She addressed her husband, who was as young as she was. He was totally immersed in his favorite job. Not much at home, of course. Technical high school teacher, not even a school teacher. He was required to immerse himself in two areas at once. Educating children and organizing scientific work and practice with them. Jacob came tired and did not really get involved in domestic affairs, but the recovery of the body needed, and he in good conscience, admittedly, would be happy to more often visit his favorite wife in the marital bed. And secretly he was also waiting for his student to move in. It's a young business. Stay. Hold the young husband, but not too convincingly. She did. And I didn't regret it at all. Whoever hasn't lived in such a town is not a student. A girl from the provinces had an easy disposition. She excelled in her studies. But most of all she was attracted to the section of tourism, in which there were many strong and as cheerful as herself. Boys and girls, especially guys. One of them caught her eye. Tall. A head taller than Adriana herself. Mighty blonde. The name Edward seemed strange. But it didn't fit a regular guy with big hands, and obviously familiar with a shovel paddle or even a hunting rifle. And he's like a normal student in general. Quietly questioned Adriana his classmates, as everyone answered her. In his studies, of course, he was diligent and hardworking, but sometimes he would give away an idea. Last week, I offered to replace one tricky thing in the cleaning on the machine, and it worked like a charm. Imagine, even our professor was surprised he didn't think of it himself. And really this one, as he was called by his friends, gave out a proposal, which was so eager to try and practice. Technical University. But even here such bright heads are not often found. And in the student trial gathered a core of the same thorough, thoughtful guys. No one was surprised when later they stayed together and set up the production of household appliances. During camping trips it was often Adriana who found herself next to him. Or maybe she was the one who inadvertently fell into his arms. He was so big and handsome. He seemed strong and dependable. In fact, he was. No, he wasn't. The tough guy would stop the newcomer and go to fix a peg for the tent. And that's how he tried it, took a knife from his buddy, and showed him how to pinch small chips and dry wood to quickly start a fire. And when he ruled a sprain with one sharp movement, on the mountain trail along the very line, he became almost a god to her. She had stayed up all night, grateful, remembering the warmth of his hands on her ankle and reimagining his hair in front of her. Her leg ached, but she could still make out his curls. It must be true what they say about the rescue becoming special to the one who saved him. And so it was with Adriana. He was now taking her everywhere. Hey, could call out to her from afar. The hard route ran over your leg today. You hear that? Well, it's axe porridge today. He teased her when it was her turn to make porridge. So gradually, imperceptibly, he became closer and closer. She sang and couldn't believe her happiness. However, she did not give any sign by the end of the hike. The comrades, who noticed their not quite usual affection for each other, began to shout them both these jars. It was exactly affection, because they walked together as if attached to each other. And the two bright heads were always glimpsing each other. When will you call me to the wedding? The sacramental question was finally asked at the end of the hike. Oh really? What wedding? Adriana blushed. Here lie down, order a cafe and we'll call you there. Edward joked. There was no wedding. What kind of wedding for students? But we went to the registry office. They drank champagne to the guitar, sang and had fun. Soon Edward graduated from the institute. And a year later Adriana and Edward defended themselves. Got their diplomas rented a place to live and started a modest, as in student life. Instead of a couple at the institute, they worked in their cooperative, as it was then customary to call a private enterprise, no matter how big or small. Edward turned out to be not such a strong technical genius, as it seemed in his student days. But he got to know such good fellows who could do incredible things in a couple of days. His decency and responsibility impressed almost everyone who was acquainted with him. 
and when he made his case for cooperation, many of that old guard willingly went. Their time had come precisely at the moment when industrial production was being destroyed in the country. The adventurism of youth bringing friends together. An idea. The gusto and fervor were not yet wasted. The forces moved them. Eh, how brave are young people who do not assume failure and Oblomov. This ignorance allows them to act without regard to authority. Listen, old man, we're solving a question. You should run up. No one can solve it but you, you understand? It's a matter of honor, old man. And the old man drove, walked, called back. Even though Edward never promised him anything, never lured him in, he was just a man of action. Talents flocked like butterflies to the light. They all wanted to do the real thing, to break a sweat. They wanted to give it their all, they wanted it to be interesting. So that steam would come out of your ears, and then a sigh of relief would burst out of your chest. We found it, we did it. Ed said, what did you do to lure me in, tell me? I mean, he's a talent. He'll win the Nobel Prize if he puts his inventions together and shows them off. And you keep him in a chicken coop where he can't breathe. I'm not thinking, I'm thinking. You don't understand anything about sausage trimmings, googled Ed, grabbing his little wife by the shoulders and putting her in front of him. He didn't come to the office. He's come to us, understand. Well, how do you want it? And people shouldn't be working under these conditions. Adriana spoke. Let's calculate how much we need for new windows. Furniture again to renew. While these computers are state of the art, they're standing on shabby, almost dumpy desks. Come on, I'll order them tomorrow. Sign right here, that's scratching my thick hair. Sighing, signing sometimes with elephants. What's a dump? Adriana, for God's sake. Your son-in-law took them from the school desks. At least don't say that to him. My sister's husband really did spend years directing the floor at a vocational college and on an acquaintance helped and written off from the risky desks of his. How to resist the kinder charm. The two families lived amicably, meeting at the dinner table on holidays. But not so long ago, Anna and Jacob moved to a neighboring town where their son studied at the Institute. Adriana, although she was not in the specialty of the accounting center, from the first days was engaged in the payroll of employees and other small matters, to which Edward did not reach hands. A woman's eye sees the world differently. And sometimes the wife could notice Edward's nose and his shortcomings, which he marveled at. Wow, I wouldn't have realized. The years went by, then flew by, and they were the same amorous little panic. Head to head solving life's problems on vacation. The spouses would go hiking for old memories, mastering the most different, most difficult routes. One day, they had to interrupt the hike at the most unexpected moment. The son-in-law had a heart attack. He died overnight. My nephew was only in his first year of study, no comrades, no life experience. The sister in the new town had no time to recognize anyone. In addition, in the terrible grief of confusion, the funeral chores fell on Edward's shoulders. Adriana comforted her sister as best she could. You want us to take you back. We'll find you a comfortable apartment. You'll get a job. There's always a part-time job at Edward's office. You'll be fine, Anna. I can't go back there. Don't you understand? I was in tears. Anna, every time I see you, my heart bleeds for the good times we had. Why did you ever think of moving? He could have worked at his college quietly. No, he's got to go into manufacturing. These plans are stressful. And Anna cried again and reread, unable to talk about anything else. Edward had gone home business was not waiting. Adriana stayed behind to help her sister and support her at least for the first time. She was well aware that Jacob had no chance of survival. That was what the doctors had explained after the autopsy. It was such a case that a heart defect does not manifest itself in any way during a person's lifetime. And it is impossible to be saved from its manifestation without knowing about it in advance. Anna, however, did not want to hear this. She fixated on unbelievable options to save her husband and blamed herself. She took almost all her sister's worries upon herself and held awake for nine days as she remained indifferent. Why was Anna saying all this? Would it bring Jasoba back? I started crying again. 
it was also impossible to sort out the dead man's personal belongings in front of her. She would just get hysterical. Adriana and Andrew tried to deal with this burdensome matter as quickly as possible. When did Anna go to the cemetery? She went to Jacob's grave every day and came back in tears. Neither her son nor her sister could resist. How can you keep a man from love? A trifle to the dead. No matter how much I try to help, but everyone must survive the death of a loved one himself. Adriana had work waiting for her. Edward could use the support and care of his wife, and here Anna must come out of her depression in time, and the absence of her sister will only be to her benefit. Otherwise, she will live in her fragile shell of grief, not taking in any worries from a fellow's determination and concern for the student's son. If Andrew does not break through this wall between mother and everyday life, then no one else will. That was what Adriana assumed. With a heavy heart she left her two loved ones. But now lonely people, long conversations, and doing things together with her nephew had brought them even closer together. And now Adriana made daily calls not only to her sister but also to Andrew. Oh, Aunt Adriana, Andrew lamented. Mom is unrecognizable. She's turning into an old lady. Now she's started going to church. Can you imagine? Praying. Baptizing. She even smells like someone else's heavy odor. I don't know what to do. They say that daughters often repeat the fate of their sister's mother Adriana. Anna exactly repeated the death of her husband, drove her into such depression that the woman began to melt before her eyes. The son did not know how to make his mother enjoy life. Moving mother became lethargic, without initiative. Everything was falling out of her hands. Constant gloomy mood and helplessness possessed her. So the weeks dragged on for months. At first Anna hardly went to work. It distracted her a little and kept her going. But one day came when she simply did not get up in the morning. The doctor, who was called by her exhausted son, gave a referral for tests. But in the morning, the mother lay listless and didn't want to get up. Andrew called his aunt and son-in-law. Immediately the relatives arrived and were amazed at how much Anna had given up. She was almost an old woman with a faded look, dressed in anything. She spent most of her time in silence, sitting somewhere and looking at herself. Shocked, the couple decided that they would come every weekend, wasting their energy and money on a short trip. As soon as the work week was over, Adriana and Edward drove to Anna's house, taking her out to a restaurant in the countryside. Her sister even began to smile when she remembered the childish pranks or words of little Andrew. But no matter what her loved ones did for her, then Anna returned again and again to her once again private state. Soon things got even worse. Anna began to fall down on the spot. Son, I can't see anything. With horror, she said to Andrew, when he came back from class and hurriedly prepared lunch. Would you at least read me what is written in the newspapers? But then Veda was forgotten again and sat aloof in thoughts unknown to the boy. In the meantime, her son was doing his best, growing older and stronger, calling the line and in an almost rapturous voice, his aunt said, I got a part-time job in a restaurant as a waiter. Sometimes I get tips. I'd really like to continue. Thank you, Uncle Edward, for your help, of course. But I like to have more fun. I'm not the only one here. There's more of us. Andrew's voice sounded cheerful, and he didn't want to object. Let the boy husband decided to marry the money that Edward sent. Of course, enough. But Andrew was a man. He dreamed of independence. Turns out he was too early for that. Soon the part-time jobs were gone. His mother's health required his constant attention. It was clear that it was not depression. Soon Anna was admitted to the hospital. A terrible thing was revealed. They found a tumor in the brain, which was pressing on the optic nerves. The disease progressed so quickly that there was no point in surgery. Within two months, Anna was literally burnt out. It was not clear whether it was because of the disease that she became depressed or because of her worries after the death of her husband. The tumor developed so quickly. Andrew was left without a father and mother, and it was necessary to finish his studies. Andrew told him Edward, study hard, don't think about bad things. You can't get your parents back, you have a life to live, and you must live successfully and happily, Adriana added. Yes, I must, happily, Edward confirmed seriously. Don't worry about money. 
We'll also send you the amount you need. Finish your studies. Welcome to our company. In the meantime, all weekends and vacations are waiting for you. And once again, we'll be traveling with sad worries. Again, the packing up of the closest person. Memorial tables, candles. Adriana found it very difficult. Even more painful for Andrew. Without a family, her favorite boy, so kind, so tenacious, so diligent. Andrew, it's okay. You know when kids bury their parents. It's when parents have to lose their kids, that's terrible. So take it for what it's worth. Well, some people have to do it sooner, some people have to do it later. She kissed him on the top of his head, tilted his fair head toward her and tried not to cry. If only he had a girl, it wouldn't be so depressing to leave. But no, he'd given himself to taking care of his mother. He had no time for relationships. Yes, I understand. Aunt Adriana, I'm fine. Andrew calmed her down and hid his eyes too. Now they understood a lot about their mother's and sister's behavior, but there was nothing they could do. Adriana tried as much as possible to give her nephew the warmth he received from his mother. How unfortunate it was for the nephew. The couple had to go to their home. They could not live because of the young man. They could not talk in the evenings about anything but Anna's death. Maybe it was a fatal mistake. Adriana wondered aloud. Maybe Anna should have gone back. At least here, we're already settled, both people and town. Adriana will take her death anyway. Edward said sadly, you realize that, don't you? She'll wait until you're in the fall. She will deceive, but she will steal the one who must die on this day at this hour. You can explain it however you want. Yes, Adriana understood. She thought again of her mother, who couldn't get over her husband's death. Her parents were not a quiet, friendly couple. Their relationship was reminiscent of Italian movies. The jealous mom was always suspicious of her father, calling back to work if he was running late. The father was patient and silent for a long time, then he exploded. The girls, Anna and Adriana would cover their ears. Then the parents, as if nothing had happened, decided to go to the theater, to visit or to a banquet, quickly packed up and left for the South, entrusting their daughters with an independent existence. The girls laughed at their parents' eccentricities because they knew how they adore each other's first words when dad returned from work were, where's mom? Is she home? Mother, taking off her shoes in the hallway, already asked where's daddy already come. And when the father fell under the car drunk, slack-jawed, the mother barely lived without him for a year, then quietly died in her sleep, not giving trouble to her daughters. It seems that with the death of her husband, she completely lost the source of life, did not raise her voice, did not show any passion, and was a smooth, boring aunt. And she hadn't even retired yet. If Anna didn't have Adriana and Adriana didn't have Anna, it's hard to imagine how they would have borne the loss of their parents. Everyone. Sisterly attachment is stronger than the closest friendship. After all, sisters have known each other all their lives, ever since the youngest of them was born. And now Adriana's nephew, Andrew, was second only to her husband. Adriana herself was not given a child by God. In their youth, the couple did not suffer about it at all. They had enough of each other's company. They were never bored. So many interesting things around, so many topics for conversation and discussion. The most interesting thing was that they were together or near each other day and night. But never did Adriana have the urge to move away from her husband of what is called long married ladies to take a break from him. Apparently Edward felt the same way. You're not bored with me. Adriana asked him. You've got such smart men in your office, I'm not much good. You have such smart men in your office. Edward laughed, and I'm not so good here either. He would approach her with rags, blonde hair and say, how much paint waste at other wives to paint gray hair, and we save money. And the main thing is that it's forever. Where will we spend the savings? The wife was picking up on it. Come on, Andrew, let's buy something fashionable, let the girls hang on him. Let them. Edward waved his hand. Remember, I had sneakers and fancy jeans. If it hadn't been for those clothes, you wouldn't have interfered with me. And they kept teasing each other and goofing off. It was like it hadn't been years since they'd been romantically in love. Life is just as beautiful despite the time. Sunshine, green trees, 
mountains if you drive a bit in the right direction. When Adriana decided to take her women's health seriously and try her luck. On her birthday, it turned out it was too late for her to worry about it. Perhaps some hereditary reason had played a role. Or maybe the long-distance hikes had produced such a result that children were no longer possible. All right, Edward waved his hand. When she told him about the unfortunate doctor's visit, not everyone has to be a parent, and not everyone can have one after all. Andrew was being sly. Maybe he just wanted to reassure his wife, so she wouldn't have an inferiority complex. Later Adriana would conjure up this moment many times. But how do you know how the husband really felt? And what good would it do? You can't get back what you've lost. They've traveled to so many countries. It's easier to travel comfortably now, and they still go camping. Like 15 years ago, this summer, Andrew went on an internship. We'll take advantage of the moment. Suggested to his wife, Edward, wherever we've been. Let's go mountain hiking. Look at the route. Oh, that's a whole new direction. It's my dream. Adriana was excited. Light, slim, like a girl. She was pretty and still young looking. Her health had never let her down until then. But this summer, Lena had a hard time going on a hike. Already on the train, she felt short of air. As she stepped onto the platform, her heart clenched. You look pale. Edward was worried. Woman's day. I don't think so. I'm just being simple-minded. I hastened to refute his suspicions. Adriana, it'll pass in the air. What's the air like here? And she put her face to the fresh breeze. The climb up the mountain again brought her difficulty in breathing and she felt dizzy and dizzy again. It seemed to have passed only a little, but she was already powerless and sat down right on the path on a large boulder. Let's go down, Edward said sharply. He helped his wife up and dragged her down. The descent took a long time. The couple stopped from time to time so that Adriana could rest. At the bottom, she was put to bed, but her strength recovered too slowly. The injections given by the paramedic on duty did not help. Adriana and Edward were driven to the nearest hospital by random hitchhikers in a large jeep. Other cars would hardly have been able to travel that way or rather off-road. Edward spent the night in a chair in the hospital corridor. In the morning, he could hardly wait for the doctor to examine his wife. Alas, the doctor said, your wife has something more serious than fatigue or malaise by the looks of it. I believe a CT scan is required. We don't even have a decent x-ray machine. The elderly doctor sighed and thought about it. You know what? We'll keep her here for now. We'll help the body gather strength, and you contact a serious medical institution. Then you'll know exactly where you're going, and your wife's trip will be easier. For now, I'd recommend she rest. The frustrated Edward shook the doctor's hand and went to call his relatives, which meant he had almost no time left to look for friends who could help. Calling on all reserves and resources, Edward drove his wife to the regional center and put her in a good clinic. Friends helped. The narrow specialists suspected the same thing from all the symptoms. It was he cancer, a death that creeps up and gnaws into the body stealthily, sneakily. After setting aside the time necessary for the examination, Adriana returned home, even though her sister had died of cancer. She so didn't want to believe the damned diagnosis. How could it be? She asked her husband a question for which there was no answer. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke. I'm perfectly happy in my personal life. I'm doing well at work. It's written that this disease comes from stress and worry. She was sitting down. Sister Anna also thought she was a happy woman. But it happened, as it happened. Lenochka, don't worry. Edward took her hand. Medicine doesn't stand still. As long as you heal, your body will fight. In the meantime, scientists will come up with a way to finally defeat the disease. We'll fight to the bitter end. We'll beat it. Adriana believed in her husband, otherwise there was no other way to live. He had always been her rock. And now she too felt that she was not alone in the face of the disease. Edward had never given her a reason not to trust him. He had never once in his life failed her in major matters and issues. All decisions were made together in concert, so she threw herself into the fight of her life, drank all possible medicines, used folk remedies, in time to lie down for routine treatment in the hospital. 
At the same time, she tried to stay awake, to look after herself. In front of my eyes stood the image of a sick sister with faded eyes, waving her hand, and eerily indifferent to her appearance. Adriana loved her husband and wanted to remain for him as desirable and sweet as she had always been. She believed that together they would conquer the disease. Edward was touchingly patient, with her dragging through the hard and dark days. When the disease worsened, weeks of remission came quickly as she took walks, watched movies, read books. Every minute she felt her husband's care unfailing and not intrusive. And then there was always her beloved Marquise nearby. She felt the mistress as no one else fluffy friend did not remember the evil because the owners always left her alone in the cat cattery when they left on a trip or went on a camping trip. But the cat forgave it to people because she was attached to them and she had already developed an addiction to this mode of existence. She lay down at her mistress's side, rearranged herself on the sore spot and Callus soothing purr stroked the fluffy fur at Marquise's side. Adriana was making plans and that's when she recovered. Thus began her next dreamy evening with Edward. Of course, it wasn't easy for her husband. He had to keep up with work, communicate with the attending raspberry, doctors, organize appointments for the procedure at home, and cooking, cleaning. I mean, he had to take care of that too. Adriana was helpless at times, and when a little withdrawn, she felt so disgusted with earthly affairs that she wanted to turn to the wall and not see anyone. And again, her favorite Marquise came to her aid. Perhaps those who regard their presence in the house as a healer are right. In any case, on Adriana's soft smile of her cozy creature acted exactly healing. Well, or has happened more and more often at least soothing. It wasn't like it had been at the beginning of her illness now, when Adriana had dashed to work on good days. What about my boys again, everything must have smelled like tobacco smoke. And Hope's not mopping the floor as well again. I gotta keep an eye on her, it's always a mess in the bathroom. Calm down, my husband laughed, we have no irreplaceable, but immediately faltered under her gaze and coped. But there are unique ones. This is our Adriana, Jenna. Your assistant won't do everything of course. Like you, she's still a little inexperienced, but she's doing fine. So don't worry, rest and regain your strength. I just bought you some vitamins. And he immediately went to the kitchen, called a bunch of rings and so switched Adriana's attention to some special overseas fruits. Then, seating her in a corner not far from him, he would prepare dinner. He understood how dreary it was for a sick person to be home alone, all day without much to do, and often still suffering from nausea and pain. So the first thing he did was to make sure they were in the same room and close to each other in the evenings. Adriana's assistant had been cooking for a long time. It was a young woman Jenna from the neighborhood, a widow with a small child. The child was what made her needy, and at the same time could not work full-time, only studied, formed her part-time, and soon Adriana became convinced that Jenna was diligent in getting into details. She began to trust her with more and more important work. Truth be told, she didn't like it very much. Jenna's manner of talking and loud annoying laughter. Well, what can you do? It's the new generation. They are so well-mannered and have no complexes, which is also considered to work well and not bad. And still at first Adriana was not worried about her place. No, about the job. Exactly for how they will manage without her. But after all, Edward is well aware of the situation in the office. He reassured her, you taught yourself the light. And you know very well she's a smart girl, she's trying. So it's all right. We've got a paycheck and a comfortable workplace. You'd think, what else is there? But recovery didn't come. Periods of good health became less frequent. And in short, the exacerbation of the disease became more frequent and prolonged. Adriana didn't sleep well at night, and from the very beginning of her illness, and asked to be left alone in bed. Her husband moved into the next room without complaint for the night, leaving the door open to hear her if she needed anything. Then the need arose for him to work on some paperwork. When Adriana was well, he was sometimes able to stay late in the workroom. Adriana could walk home alone or go to a cafe with a friend, waiting for him to return for a late dinner and now he secluded himself in his room. 
So little by little, the couple began to drift apart. The evenings became quiet. Conversations faded away. What was there to discuss if they didn't go anywhere together, saw nothing, talked to no one? Five whole years passed in such an environment. A saint would not have been able to endure so long around a sick man. Edward, on the other hand, behaved as always, continued to care for his wife, and was unfailingly even-tempered. Preoccupied with her pain, Adriana never reflected on her husband's behavior, believing it to be as it should be. She took his labors for granted. Sick people are so often selfishly blind to other people's problems. Increasingly, she had to resort to sleeping pills and painkillers. Edward had long ago also handled these himself skillfully, like a professional nurse. Adriana had loved his big, warm hands since her long-ago camping trips. They were the skillful, strong hands of a master of the slain man. Yet the strength in them was special, gentle. Or maybe it seemed that way to Adriana. Today, he was administering her anesthetic. After the injection, the patient lay quietly, turned away as always to the wall, covering her eyelids, listening to what was happening outside. At this time, in the kitchen, where her husband was clearing the table after dinner, his cell phone rang. Edward, in a muffled voice, started the conversation. It became clear who he was talking to the woman who had come into the company for her Adriana seat. When had she gotten sick? The specifics of the job were so well known to the line that she could guess Edward's interlocutor by two or three phrases. Yes, this is Jenna, of course, a business conversation. But suddenly his intonation changed, became stealing. Some kind of intimate barely knowing line. Well, something sweet, said Edward, muffled by his beautiful baritone, everything will be fine. Just a little bit. Be patient tonight. Of course not, no, no, I can't. She's asleep for now, but she'll wake up soon. What are you doing? I almost shrieked. Edward immediately lowered his voice almost to a whisper. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Kisses. Adriana couldn't understand what this conversation meant. But everything is clear and understandable. Her husband, and it is an uninspired young relationship. But does it happen like that? How is it possible? This is her husband's own, the only one the first and the last. He's caring and attentive. It's perfect. Adriana didn't bat an eye herself. Her temples pounded. Caring, attentive. Perfect pretended to be asleep until her husband retired to his room for the night. Then she gathered her strength with great exertion, trying not to make noise, dragged from the mezzanine suitcase, with which once in the happy days of the two of them went to Europe. Her husband was breathing evenly and quietly in the next bedroom. She knew his habit, just put his head on the pillow. He sleeps like a dead man. Already calmer, she gathered his things and neatly stacked the suitcases on the in advance took to the kitchen. An empty one for now. I knew that a full one wouldn't lift him, and I couldn't carry it. Looked around once more the closet shelves. But I think I've packed all the essentials. Till Dawn sat in the chair, either in oblivion or in half-drama. But I had no strength to think about what was happening. Granson crouched faithful Marquise. Here it was morning heard Edward got up and went to the toilet. Then Adriana rose from her seat and went to the kitchen. She poured water into the kettle and lit the gas burner. You will not drink tea today, she said as if to herself, but she addressed it to her husband. He had just entered the kitchen, wiping his face and neck with a snow white towel. Good morning. How did she sleep? Why are you up so early? He reached out to kiss her but Adriana pulled away, and he almost tripped over a suitcase. What's this? And immediately his face began to lose its features before Adriana's eyes. It was very frightening to see. There was one man standing in front of her, and half a minute later another, completely lost. Disintegrated. A stranger. He understood everything. Go away, Adriana said calmly. I heard your conversation. There's a child in there, he said. After a silence, the son is three years old. Forgive me, I couldn't tell you. It would have been too cruel. Did you hope I would die and not find out? Adriana asked in a strange voice. I'm sorry, there's no way I can die. Would you have gotten married then? Go away. Edward silently took his suitcase and left. 
Adriana looked at him and wondered how this dearly loved man was now suddenly a stranger. How could it be? Could it be that she was in some kind of suspended state? Couldn't help crying and cursing her lovers. She froze and then went to the window, then sat in the chair, mindlessly looking in front of herself, to realize what had happened could not. A day later, I went to the hospital in a very bad condition. Were you under some kind of stress? The doctor asked, a pretty, dry woman a little younger than Adriana herself. Not really. Faintly, Adriana answered, although it was clear from her voice that yes, of course it had been. This time the treatment was very hard and slow. The ambulance was called by a neighbor to take Marcus to the usual place there was no one. Worried about the cat, which for the first time was left without care and supervision, she called her nephew. Andrew, try to come. Please. I'm begging you, honey. The cat's all alone in there. I didn't have time to warn anyone. Adriana herself did not understand why now. After so many days of loneliness and patience, large tears rolled down her cheeks. Before, she had been like a dried-up pond with cracks at the bottom of her dark, soulless dried-up neck. Andrew was upset that the aunt was in the hospital again, and promised to come back soon. He was quite satisfied with the stated business trip. When he asked in surprise where Edward was, his nephew had indeed arrived. He was to not only take care of his aunt, but also to become an operative, to listen to Adriana's heavy account of what had happened. Aunt Adriana, he said, hugging the slim to down. Woman, you are strong. Do you remember how you took care of mom? How you explained everything well to her? I can't do that, but you realize you have to live. And your uncle? But let him live once. He can do that. You're right. Adriana supported him warmly. Let him live, how much he's taken care of me. I should be grateful to him. Really, Andrew? She peered inquisitively into the young man's eyes, but he averted his gaze. What could he say? How could he, answers for a strong adult. Everyone makes his own choices. From that day on, the boy helped his aunt in any way he could. He came to her every time she called. He took care of all the cases that required walking to all sorts of authorities. He was the one who talked to the doctors and delivered the medicine. It was good that he was well regarded by his superiors at his workplace, where he worked for the second year after graduating from the institute. Realizing the need to travel, they let him go, gave him time off. Once Andrew came to bring his aunt from the hospital, he decided to clean up so that the apartment was at least clean. He booed the symbol of the floor. When the doorbell rang, Edward stood on the doorstep. Hello, Andrew, gloomy. He said hello without expressing surprise. Hi. Andrew was a little confused. Don't you have a key? I do. Why not? Edward took a bunch of keys out of his pocket. It's just inconvenient. I wanted to return it to the line. Come on in. Andrew moved aside, clearing the passage. Here are my floors. Aunt Lena's being discharged tomorrow. I thought I'd freshen the air, so to speak. Edward held himself as stiffly as a guest. It was obvious he was uncomfortable. The conversation wasn't going well. Meanwhile, Andrew put a kettle on the table, put cookies, butter and tea on the table. Having poured it into cups, he moved the guest and made an inviting gesture. Come on, let's drink tea. All his movements were practiced. Taking care of his mother had given him the skills of housekeeping. The boy got it. Thought he was still on the prowl himself. Eh, and here I am. The boy looked at him uncomprehendingly, but his gaze was so bright and guileless that Edward didn't realize how he'd spoken about it. You may judge me, of course. He began. Yes, I am a traitor. Adriana is my only love. But it just so happens that this woman... He hesitated, but he didn't call the light by name. Turned out to be pregnant, a chance encounter, fleeting. But she wouldn't let me rest. You see, she wouldn't say a word, but she kept looking at me like that. And I was tired. I got weak. It just happened. Andrew listened silently, keeping his eyes open as Edward sighed heavily and clutched his head with both hands resting on his knees. And then my son was born, and that was it. I couldn't leave them. It's three years now. They sat in silence. Then Andrew said, 
Uncle, I'm not your judge, you've always helped me. But I know one thing for sure, Aunt Adriana would never have left you. Five ten years of her whole life she would have been with you. I know, Edward almost whispered. I know. That's why I don't apologize. It's hard. Rising from his chair, he put the keys to the tea beside the cup without touching it. Maria listened to Adriana and realized that she didn't want to remain so lonely by her old age. She already wanted to leave this empty apartment, to start living in a different way, to be light at heart, light in the house. She sympathized with Adriana with all her heart and was ready to help her. And so the day came before the trip to the hospital. Adriana had warned her in advance, and Maria came in the evening with the clear intention of taking the cat home with her. Adriana had also prepared in advance. Maria. Marquise got used to her a long time ago. And here is the rest of the food. True, I haven't been out lately, so it's not much. But I think it's enough for a couple of days. And these are the essentials. These are our Marquesa's favorite toys. She put a ball, a rubber mouse, and a couple of other things next to it. The woman says a long goodbye to her pet. She whispers softly in her ear. Only she can hear the words. Then she let her go and Marquesa silently climbed into the carrier. Well then we're off, Maria said. Finally, taking the bag of belongings in one hand and the other, she walked toward the exit. Goodbye, Adriana. Have a good day. I'll be sure to call you. Adriana nodded and turned back to the window, holding back tears. Outside the window, a cold autumn rain was falling in unison with her mood. While Maria was carrying Marquis home, she was soaking wet. Wait. The bus in the rain wasn't very pleasant either, so she decided to do the easier thing. She walked. It was warm and cozy to dry in her apartment anyway. Letting the cat out of the carrier, she said welcome to the new home of Marcus. Now you will be a mistress here to keep order, catch mice. Remember the main thing to remember. Caressing the cat affectionately, she lowered it to the floor and went about her business. She hung up her wet coat and scarf and put her shoes on to dry. Marquise sat by her things at first, then slowly she began to settle in. She walked around her new home for a long time, looking in all the corners. She did it all in silence. She slept on her own bed, which she had given to Adriana, and from then on she slept only on it. In the morning she went to work, Maria poured her food, poured water, and punished Marcus. You stay for the mistress, agreed. If anything, my dear, not to me all by. And left. The new resident got used to the apartment and the mistress not immediately. Maria didn't know how the Marquisa behaved during the day alone in empty rooms. She would go to her office, return early in the morning and in the evening. Always worried. How was Marquesa without her? Does not yearn for the former dwelling on his native mistress worried about the health of the cat. But coming in the evening, she made sure that she had eaten a little, but enough not to starve and lose weight. She sighed. Then cleaned the litter box and took the white Marcus in her arms. You're my good sweetheart, I know this is hard for you. You're like a flower that's been transplanted into different soil. Mommy didn't betray you, you know that. That's just the way it is. And I'll take care of you. Don't be sad, my good ones. We'll be friends. Okay. The cat listened and was silent. She hadn't raised her voice once since she'd moved into Maria's apartment. It was strange, confusing, and scary. Maria was worried. Then she decided to calm down and wait. Since the cat was healthy, she didn't show any signs of anxiety. Why are you so quiet? I asked she strokes the soft fur. That's the kind of Marquesa you eat. I promise you will visit your mommy Marquesa. You just don't get upset. Maria called Adriana several times at the hospital, then sent pictures of Marquise. The woman was very grateful to her, but her voice grew quieter and quieter each time. Several months passed, and then one day close to spring, Maria's call was not answered, nor the next day. Then a man answered the phone. Hello, are you calling Aunt Adriana? She's in the hospital. This is her nephew, Andrew. Maria almost shrieked. This is Maria, a friend of hers. I know she's in the hospital. She's not well. Hello, Maria. Auntie's gotten worse. She's been unconscious for two days. Andrew's voice sounded depressed. And you've come for a long time. 
Will you be by her side? Maria shuffled from foot to foot excitedly and suddenly had a very strong desire to help Adriana. I took a vacation, auntie has no one but me, Andrew explained. How could he know that Maria knew about this detail of Adriana's biography? And Maria made up her mind. Andrew, will you let me visit her? Let's get something for the doctors to let me into the room. It's not like I'm a relative and I need to see her, reassure her. Well, let's try a little confused from such pressure, Andrew. The girl realized that arguments are necessary. You see, I have a cat, Adriana Marquesa. I would like to calm her down, tell her about the cat, explain that everything is all right. Maybe it would make her feel better. Oh, that's what this is about. Andrew was pleased. You're the girl with the beautiful eyes and the kind heart. I got a reply. She told me about you. Come tomorrow between two and five. I'll tell her you're my fiancé. Maria was embarrassed and confused at the same time. She hadn't expected such compliments, so she could only say, thank you until tomorrow. At night, the girl woke up from the fact that in her head from somewhere a vivid picture appeared in a bright room she held in her hands a snow white and a cat, as if the picture had formed. Yes, she must pass to Adriana with the Marcus drive to the hospital, with the cat in the bag was easy. And at the hospital itself, Maria chickened out. She did her best, as visibly as possible to blink past the grenadier-looking janitor who sat on the passageway to the stairs leading to the rooms for the bedridden. But she was alert, even though there were plenty of visitors. She snatched Maria with a glance and shouted, because apparently she could not speak quietly. And you, my dear, where are you going? To room 202. Maria got agitated again. Thank God. Andrew took care of the pass and called her in advance, warning her that there and there you can get it in hand, otherwise the janitor will not let you through. The groom grinned Maria to herself. The Marquise had not failed in the slightest, unaware of the zoo in her bag. The janitor nodded, and Maria began to ascend to the right floor. Here was the lower ward, quietly opening the door Maria prepared to see Adriana's dead face. For that reason alone, reality was not listening to her. Adriana lay with her eyes closed. Her mouth was outlined by a thin line of bloodless lips, her breathing almost imperceptibly moving the sheet on her chest. Had there been other patients in the ward, Maria would hardly have been able to recognize the mistress of the Marquesa at once. Thus, she had changed before. Thin and pale, now Adriana's face had quite lost its individual features and had become as if a symbol on Brodsky of the human face. A dream, Maria thought, this is my dream. In the ward, and so completely painted white, was even lighter from the sun, and snow outside the window, reigned here impersonal, without life nobility frightening with its perfect network. She had to get used to it first. Maria stood at the door for a moment, then slowly approached the bed. The sick woman carefully took the cat out of her bag, which had not surrendered a sound so far, and carefully placed it on Adriana's bed. The Marquise did not look back at the foreign walls. Immediately she lay down next to her mistress and began licking her hands. Maria was amazed at this instant foundation. My God! She whispered in reverential horror, the Marquise, and recognized her. And then the cat screamed. These sounds could not be called a horse. It was a wild one. Never had Marina heard a cry before, either. As if the animal was tormented by terrible pains, Marquise was saying goodbye to her mistress in horror at these heart-rending moans of Marquise. Maria grabbed the cat tightly in an armful and rushed out of the room, then back down the corridor, down the stairs to the exit. Leaving behind her bewilderment, turmoil, and terror, she could no longer see the orderlies and nurses scrambling to the patient's room to see if she could get around on her own. To find the source of the terrible howl, paralyzed and instilled with animal terror, but what became known to her for certain was that Adriana had stopped breathing that very night. Very soon after their Marquesa, and hasty escape from the hospital and Maria, finally certain that it was absolutely right to give the opportunity to say goodbye to two loving each other's souls human and feline. Then there was the funeral. There were only a small handful of attendants at the funeral ceremony, consisting of neighbors and a few of Worshipful's former co-workers, a young man in his thirties stood close to the casket. 
His face expressed genuine grief. Maria guessed that it was Andrew. As they began to disperse, Maria approached him to introduce herself and express her condolences. It was a pity that we had to get acquainted under such sad circumstances. She said, your aunt loved you very much. Thank you, Maria. He said, shaking her hand with a light, musician-like movement. Aunt Adriana was very comforted that you agreed to take care of her cat. She said she was completely at peace now. Oh, really? Maria was embarrassed. It's not good of the Marquesa. Will you let me visit her? Asked Andrew. Yes, of course. Maria explained how to get to her from Adriana's house, where Andrew was to stay for the first time, and they said goodbye. At home Maria sat for a long time without doing or thinking. The cat was already accustomed to meet her mistress at the door and waited patiently for her to separate. The girl went to the armchair, took Marcus in her arms. He would mumble some quiet words or hum some forgotten songs that suddenly came to mind. Such five minutes in the evenings became their custom. Marquise received the warmth of human hands, listened with pleasure to the soft female voice. Maria relaxed, stroking the white smooth, cat-like, back and listened to the purr of a non-animal. Here we are left with you and me alone, Marquise. Maria told me quietly. Your mother has left, but don't be sad. She's calmed down now. She's well, she's not in pain. And you and I will remember her with a kind word. A few days after Adriana's funeral, Andrew called. Maria invited him to visit, remembering his request to visit the Marcus. In the evening, she hastily set the tea table. There was no need to clean up for the guest's arrival. In the house at Maria Marquise always reigned perfect order, as if in the absence of the mistress the cat diligently maintained cleanliness and coziness. Andrew came at the agreed time. He brought Marquise a big bag of cat treats and toys. Maria immediately at the entrance, handed a luxurious bouquet of huge lilies, and she immediately put the fragrant flowers on the middle of the table. The cat treated the generous gifts favorably, even regally. With strokes of her paw and whiff, tried new balls, then settled down in its accustomed place and watched the pair, conversing still at the table with lovely eyes and a satisfied label. Meanwhile, Andrew took out a bottle of Prosecco. Maria, what about you? Oh, you what? No, there isn't. Never had a need. The hostess was confused. She couldn't tell me that all these years she'd lived lonely without merry company. Frankly speaking, my evenings were no different from those of an old woman, a pensioner. Meanwhile, at work she was quite sociable and was quite attractive. No way, said Andrew. Decidedly, the straight line will be drawn. Problem solved. The bottle simply must be opened and drunk. I can't afford any weakness today. How can one not drink good wine with such a beauty on their first meeting? Maria is lively and cheerful. America has introduced more and more new tools. Try a fork. Here's a knife. Oh, wait. I have a screwdriver. And she giggled, dragging the most valuable, in her opinion, tool that could only exist in the house of an old bachelor. Laughing at his own dexterity, Andrew managed to open the bottle by improvised means. Maria brought out the glasses. The first toast was to acquaintance. Both liked the wine. Then they drank, remembering the departed Adriana. Aunt Lena was only 48, a little less than mom. Andrew said sadly, she was my mom for the last few years. She called every day, sent me money, even clothes. She and Uncle Id bought them for me without me. Aunt Adriana accurately guessed my size and my tastes, Edward. He was at the funeral. Maria asked, no, I didn't call him. But their mutual co-workers said that he was away with the baby for some kind of baby checkup. You know, Maria, Aunt Adriana didn't say anything about him at the end of his illness. I think she forgave him. She loved him very much and thought he deserved to be happy with a son, at least in his old age. I guess I'm a maximalist. I can't forgive Uncle Edward. I talk to him whenever I get the chance. I'd even understand to some extent what he did. But you know, Aunt Adriana, she was all straight and honest. No secret criminal anywhere for any money. She should have been happy from start to finish. But it's a cursed disease. I'm sorry we met her so late, Maria replied. 
I've always dreamed of having a friend. Adriana is older. All the more reason for me to be good to her. Oh, you just didn't see her young Maria. She was like a light that lit everybody up. She was bright, you know, and she still had a wonderful life. Really, Maria looked up to him. And from what you remember, she gave herself to life to the fullest. That's great. But I always wondered if she was alone. I mean, she had friends, comrades, from way back. She remembered them so warmly. I didn't feel comfortable asking about it. But it was her choice. Maria. Aunt Adriana is a person with a great sense of dignity. Andrew spoke of Lena as if she were alive. When she got sick, she deleted herself from all social media. She stopped even answering her cell phone. She was determined she wasn't going to overshadow other people's lives. Let her friends not see her helplessly weak. And it was only for me that she had to make an exception after chemo. We've always been very close. How could she do without support? It was physically impossible. Andrew confirmed that he would be selling the apartment in six months. By law, he was only entitled to it after that period. But today, they felt so good that they didn't want to talk about business or anything sad anymore. Andrew and Marina sat up until almost dawn. It seemed to both of them that they had known each other for a very long time. It was amazing how much they had in common. Movies, favorite songs, poems. They even liked the same writers and poets. Saying goodbye, Andrew suddenly kissed Maria on the cheek. In the afternoon benefits during Maria's lunch break, he called her again, Maria, I was urgently called to work. I'm leaving tonight, and I was so looking forward to meeting you today. What can I do? He said pitifully, so let me come and see you off. Without a second thought, Maria blurted out, and she was very surprised at her own determination. Andrew rejoiced. Really, I wouldn't dream of coming. Come straight from work to my apartment. We'll have dinner together somewhere, and then we'll go to the train station. The evening was very short, but as wonderful as the previous light dinner, farewell at the train station. And now Maria is home. Hearing Andrew himself called and paid for a cab, so that the girl would not be alone on the deserted streets at night. A goodbye kiss completely turns Maria's head. Marquesa, what shall I do? said she to her shaggy-haired friend. I like him so much, how can I live alone now Marquesa Marquesa? reproachfully held in her arms, indignant, do you have me? Oh, you do. Maria's one life was now filled with a great bright feeling. She joyfully got up in the early morning, looked for her cat, ran to work, completely forgetting about her affairs. By the way, she used to exaggerate this flaw of hers. So Maria decided, looking at herself again and again in the big mirror in the hallway. Even though Andrew was not around, she was still expressing and expanding herself every day. She had to look 100% every minute now. And he called more than once a day, and their conversations were full of those hints, those innuendos that truly bring two people together. They had a life together. They're in the cloudy, ephemeral space that gives air to existence. Maria imagined Andrew beside her. Yes, not handsome he is, but so good. With his gorgeous smile with his quick movements, and most importantly, he treats her so carefully, as if she were made of something beatable. Vasia anticipates her every move. One sunny and June day, the doorbell rang, expecting no one. Maria in a kerchief and an old robe came to open the sudden guest Andrew. Maria was confused and overjoyed. And here I am. She entered the room in which against custom reigned chaos. Maria decided to paste the wallpaper and freshen things up. In the back of her mind, she was waiting for Andrew to arrive. After all, it would soon be six months since Adriana's death. He would have to inherit the apartment. Now I'll think of something for breakfast, she hurried after the first greetings. No, Maria, I'm not going to let you do anything on the day I arrive. Get dressed. We're going to a nice place now. They left everything in the same disheveled state and went to a cafe owned by an old acquaintance of Andrew's. Juicy steaks, sparkling wine, fruit. Maria enjoyed everything and marveled at how much pleasantness and pleasure there was in life and why she thought it wasn't all for her. Andrew opened to her small joys, but also became her great joy. Do you like it? He asked Maria lovingly, 
looking into her face while chewing grapes. Maria only mooed amusedly, showing that she was at the peak of pleasure. Andrew's visit had a practical purpose. He was going to sort out the paperwork. Maria's help in legal matters was just the right thing for him. In the afternoon they worked well with the papers, made a plan to sell Adriana's apartment. Honey, you may be wondering why I don't want to move there myself and live next to you. Softly asked Andrew, removing from the branches of hair from Maria's neck. The girl was embarrassed. She actually in the depths of her soul had been melting the hope that he would do exactly that. And now she suddenly pictured him in the empty corners of the rooms, where Adriana had spent so many sorrowful and agonizing months waiting to die. The hopelessness. Everything within those walls had been written by her. Sterile, even the apartment was without life. And despite the light from the large windows, the eerie feeling was so palpable that she didn't notice herself shrieking. No, no, Andrew, don't live there. He understood her impulse, for that was why he did not think of Adriana's dwelling as his own. No, Maria, we will live quite differently. I'll do everything for you as you want just now. Maria was afraid. But it would be worth while for a start for you he poured over the courtier's sea in America, laughing at her confusion. To marry me. Maria laughed. He waved his arms. And now he was already twirling her around the room, and she was laughing, hugging him by the neck. Scraps of old wallpaper were flung into the air too. And this strange salute was happening all by itself, in honor of their happy future union. On the window away from this ugliness sat regal eye white cat, and condescendingly axe began whiskers. What children these people are. In a few months the young people bought a wonderful house and moved far away from the noisy city. Every evening Maria had tea in the gazebo near the house. Andrew turned on the speakers and the couple listened to music. Magnificent Marquise always lay in the arms of the new mistress and peaceful purring.